All right, there we go. Well, I've got a, a few minutes of introductory remarks here to make. And uh, so again, uh, my name is Jeff Strock. I'm a soil scientist at the Southwest Research and Outreach Center um, here at Lamberton. Uh, this is our seventh triennial soil and water management field day. Of course, uh, you see on your screen there, uh, this year is a virtual event uh, because of the, uh, the global pandemic. And uh, at last count, uh, we had uh, over 100 people registered to participate. So I'm uh, grateful for everyone uh, participating today. Um, we've got a what I believe is a, a really good lineup of speakers. And as I said, we will uh, we'll be going through and we'll be using various uh, technical features. Of course, we'll be using the chat uh, in Zoom to uh, do communication um, along with a, a Slido um, tool that will be able to be used for the Q&A session. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. Um, so again, uh, welcome. I'm glad that you're all willing to, to spend part of your day. Uh, a number of years ago, I took this image uh, one early morning here at the Research Center. Uh, I wish we could be doing this in the field, um, but of course, uh, under the conditions, we aren't able to do that. Um, and with this kind of a, a sort of a sort of picturesque, uh, serene picture, I'd like everybody just to kind of keep in mind all those heroes out there that are working in the hospitals and and all of the the teachers and the caregivers of folks uh, and and also remember those uh, who've uh, struggled or lost loved ones because of the coronavirus and and um, uh, just uh, keep that in mind and as we go through the day that uh, um, there's many more people out there who probably wish they could participate and especially if we if we were able to have the day in person so um, I wanted to give uh, some additional information. Uh, it was a little bit of a struggle this year, obviously, with uh, coronavirus to, uh, to be able to kind of schedule things. Um, just the other day, I was visiting with uh, Chuck Brandle from ISG. Uh, they have a, a field event or a virtual event uh, that they ordinarily do in uh, April uh, that's actually going on at the same time our meeting is going on. Um, I told uh, Chuck that I'd give uh, his uh, session a plug. They've got two of them, uh, one today and then one on the 20th. Um, they are going to be recording their session uh, and it will be available on the ISG website. So I included that on here. Um, and uh, I've taken a screenshot and posted the Southwest Research and Outreach Center's uh, website location where um, eventually you will be able to uh, see these or at least have a link to these presentations that you'll hear today, uh, as well as to the seventh triennial proceedings. Um, I know it's a little challenging to see on the screen there uh, in the lower right side there, but um, we've got all of the proceedings from the previous years uh, listed on the, um, listed on the site there uh, and we will be adding the seventh one probably sometime next week uh, and this is a collection of of six to eight page papers uh, written by all of the presenters so not only will you have uh, their presentations that you'll be able to review for eternity uh, but you'll also be able to look at some written text uh, by each one of us um, sort of to keep track of the work that we've done and uh, have it be available for people in the future. So I'm just gonna give a little synopsis uh, about uh, some of the things that I want everybody to try to keep in mind. Um, you know, we're gonna have a, a variety of talks today relating to soil fertility uh, and water quality, uh, other multi-purpose drainage practices. Um, and, what I want everybody to keep in mind is, is that there, there are just definitely distinct advantages and disadvantages to each one of these that we're talking about. Um, we're not necessarily advocating for one or another, um, but to keep in mind that it, it's going to take um, all of these different types of practices and things that we're going to be talking about today uh, in a watershed, on a landscape in order to, to, uh, to help 
solve some of our challenges with some of the water quality issue, issues that we have while at the same time trying to maintain crop production. So one size doesn't fit all. Some of these may not fit, um, you know, in your particular region, on your particular farm. Um, and there, there aren't any silver bullets. We're, we're trying to have a, a selection of practices that everybody will be able to take a look at and consider whether it might be something that they could use. And then to ask some critical questions um, when you're thinking about uh, these presentations is, you know, will some of these work in your situation or conditions? You know, maybe there's some things that'll work fine up in the Red River Valley and they might not work quite as well in, in Southern Minnesota. Um, do the benefits and the values outweigh those risks? Are there, there costs involved? Um, we might not be going through a lot of economics in our presentations today, but uh, some of that will show up in, in some of the uh, written proceedings text. And then what are some of the impacts uh, in terms of scale? You know, are these field or small watershed size uh, impacts? Just to kind of lay out too for everyone when we think about this, um, you know, ag production is the primary driver here for us, trying to intensify things as we look into the future and global population increasing, uh, but also to have clean water and clean air and to have an adequate and abundant food supply and to have resilient soils. Um, and in order to do this, we, we need to be adding all of these components that are on the outside of that which will include productivity, profitability, and environmental quality. And I'm thinking about this from the, the grower's perspective. Um, we need to be thinking about all three uh, in order to make sure that we have a, a leg to stand on and that we have strong agriculture moving forward. Just a real brief outline here for the day. Uh, of course, I'm almost done talking and then we'll get to the first group of presentations. We'll have that discussion Q&A session, which we'll be using the Slido technology. Uh, then we'll have group two, a discussion again, uh, a little break so that people can get up and stretch. And then we will uh, have group three uh, and group four, followed by a discussion and then uh, we will conclude the day. So for using Slido, if you've not ever used this before, uh, in your browser, you can go to slido.com and you'll enter the same access code uh, that you used to get into today's meeting, seven soil water. And by doing that, you'll be able to actually get into the, the Slido event uh, area. And the, there'll be a screen that'll show up similar to what you'll see on the on the right hand side and you'll basically log in there and then it'll give you an opportunity to uh, to type in a question for the presenter so for example if fabian's speaking and you have a question that pops into your head you can go into slido type the question everybody who's looking at slido will be able to see those questions and then you'll be able to actually if somebody writes a question that you particularly like, um, you'll be able to, to like that question. And the more likes that a question gets, uh, the higher up in the queue that it gets. And, um, and then we will use those questions that are highest in the queue uh, to uh, share with the presenters. And um, uh, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll just make it through as many of those questions as we can. We might not get through all of them, uh, but uh, uh, we'll have, end up eventually having to move on to the uh, to the next uh, set of presentations. Okay, so I will pull up the first presentation here. The first presentation, um, uh, as we have it set up, will be by um, a recording by Fabian Fernandez and. Um, once I get it up in the queue here, sorry for the delay. This, and I will be reporting on some of the findings that we have obtained from uh, this uh, becoming long-term study now. We started this study in 2014, and I would also like to acknowledge my co-author in this presentation, Sonia Menegas. She's a master's student working on a project. There have been a number of uh, important changes in Minnesota that have uh, encouraged us to start the, the, the study that we are presenting today. One of the uh, changes has been in precipitation. These maps of Minnesota show 
the increasing amount of precipitation that we are getting uh, in the state, throughout the state, uh, over the last century or so, how much change there has been. The other one is temperature. These are winter temperatures, and we see over again more than a century that these temperatures are increasingly becoming warmer. And both moisture and temperature impact the potential for nitrogen loss. Warmer and wetter conditions uh, increase the potential for loss. In addition to these changes, uh, over the last um, decade or so, we have seen an increase in the amount of urea that is being used as the primary source for nitrogen in Minnesota. It used to be anhydrous ammonia was the most important nitrogen source, and now urea has replaced it. And unlike anhydrous ammonia, under uh, certain conditions in the field, urea has more potential for nitrogen loss uh, soon after the time of application, which uh, again impacts uh, what we do with management of this nitrogen source. With all these changes in mind, we decided to start this project looking at uh, a number of uh, treatments. We have four treatments that are urea and ESN, or polymer coated urea, applied pre-plant at 180 pounds of nitrogen. And then we have two uh, treatments that have a split application with urea and ESN applied pre-plant with 60 pounds of nitrogen and then a split application with urea plus agrotane at 120 pounds of nitrogen applied at V4 to V6 development stage. This study is at the Southwest Research and Outreach Center in Lamberton, and it's uh, located in uh, these plots right here, showing in this aerial image, where we have drainage plots uh, that we are able to, to look at the drainage conditions from each individual plot. The soil has high pH, it's a pH of 8, and has high organic matter content, 5% is a Webster clay loam. And with uh, these treatments in mind, the, the objectives of this study were to quantify the effect of urea and this polymer coated urea or ESN uh, source as a pre-plant and a split nitrogen application timing uh, on nitrate leaching, nitrous oxide emissions, and ammonia volatilization emissions. And a second objective was to quantify the effect of those end management practices on corn yield. So we will start by talking about the uh, grain yield since 2014. And, you know, nitrogen management is like gambling and we do research to, to understand what's the likelihood or the probability that a certain practice will provide benefits. Or in other words, how many times out of 10 you are likely to see a benefit. We see here in the results of ESN yielding better than urea in the pre-plant and also the ESN urea doing better than urea in the split application. And these uh, results are fairly consistent across most of the years. Uh, the split application, while they make logistical sense, in practice they often don't provide an improvement over the pre-plant only application, except uh, uh, possibly in the very wet springs like 2019 where the, the potential for end loss from the pre-plant application was uh, fairly large. And having some ESN in the pre-plant application seemed to help uh, likely because end release uh, is happening later in the season, as we will see in the next slide when we look at the soil. You know, in general, soil nitrogen tends to be highly variable, but I continue to be amazed in my research at seeing how grain yield results are closely followed by soil nitrogen data. Uh, the benefit in yield we saw with ESN is clearly illustrated here with soil nitrogen. Uh, we are looking at uh, ammonium and nitrate in the top 60 centimeters of the soil in this slide, and we see that consistently ESN have more N available than urea for the pre-plant application. The thing that is not clear from this slide uh, data alone is why the split application, which provides more N availability at the critical crop development stages, is not reflecting uh, or is not reflected in greater yield. 
And that's where uh, the plant data can be important, which is what we will see next. Here we are looking at uh, nitrogen in plant tissues. At V6, the pre-plant application seems to have helped the crop increase its end uptake. And this might have allowed the crop to get a better setup for, for success. At V10, all the nitrogen is already applied for all treatments, but the pre-plant applications still have slightly more nitrogen. In other words, it seems like that even though plants have all the N applied, regardless of the treatment, from V6 to V10, those with the full rate applied pre-plant were better able to take up nitrogen. And this is reflected in the soil data that we discussed earlier, where at V10, the pre-plant had lower soil nitrogen than the split application treatments. Most likely, the pre-plant application had N available, whereas the split uh, took a little longer to, to become available, and that created the difference. Those differences between the application time at V10 tend to disappear later in the season, but the end source seems to become a more important parameter. For instance, CSN treatments accumulated more, reflecting, uh, reflected in the grain yield that we already discussed. Uh, finally, just a note uh, that from R1 to R6, the values decline. This could be because at R1, we, had, uh, we were forming the year, in the plant and R6, um, we did not uh, measure that. That was only uh, the vegetative portions of the tissues. Up to this point in the presentation, we have been talking about agronomic outcomes, but uh, environmental outcomes are increasingly important and uh, this is part of the reason we are doing this study. As I mentioned, this study was set up in plots that um, allow us to measure the uh, nitrate concentrations and the amount of water that comes out of the tile drain for, for each individual plot. And so uh, you see here some pictures of the setup that we have at this site where we collect all the water that drains out of each individual plot and we are able to measure both the flow and the concentrations of nitrate in that water. And so we take uh, samples regularly and we analyze them for ammonium and nitrate and also for phosphorus. I'm only going to present data today on uh, nitrate uh, leaching. We will leave the uh, ammonium and phosphorus for a different time. Here is the data that we collected uh, through this uh, approach. The figure has several items. We show here the year and just underneath that, the amount of uh, total precipitation for the year. The color lines represent the cumulative nitrate leaching with the scale on the y-axis and the blue vertical bars represent the, the individual precipitation events with the scale on the secondary axis. The site rest fertilizer applications for all of these years were done around the middle of June. Consistent with what we saw in the agronomic responses, pre-plant ESN had the lowest nitrate leaching losses than other treatments, and the results are fairly consistent across the years. The split application tended to have a much, uh, much more nitrate loading than the standard urea pre-plant application. This may be related to precipitation patterns, as we will discuss shortly. Uh, I am not showing economic returns for what we did in this study, but um, the treatments, uh, with because they had greater yield, the, the ones with ESN, they had greater yield, um, they basically help pay for the additional cost of ESN relative to urea. Having the same economic outcomes, uh, but uh, an improved environmental benefit with ESN should be an important thing to consider. While we need to continue to improve economic returns, the environmental benefits need to be uh, continue or begin to be considered as well. Uh, just like I think we need to start paying more attention to outcomes that go beyond agronomics, um, I think we also need to be paying more attention to weather conditions as we evaluate our, uh, our practices and how well they work. Uh, and this is something that in the past we have not really paid too much attention to. Uh, consistent across all the years, and last happened in the spring when the soils tend to be fully recharged and uh, have little capacity to store additional water. Uh, also at that time the crop has uh, 
pretty low capacity to um, to take up uh, water or nitrate. We also in the fall see it that uh, the the crop stops taking nitrogen and water, and that's where we see uh, excess water starts to to leach whenever we have uh, a wet a wet fall. And much of this N is not uh, from the fertilizer, but it's actually from mineralization that occurs after the crop has reached physiological maturity. In general, we see uh, more precipitation, uh, that means more nitrogen loss, uh, but precipitation distribution is also very important. Regardless of the treatment, we see that they all follow sim sim a similar pattern. Uh, what was different was the magnitude of loss. Uh, for instance, ESM pre-plant consistently had the least amount. Normally, three to five events drive most of the end loss, and this calls into question how to best manage nitrogen. We can be doing everything correctly as far as management goes, but the odds are against us. That said, we should not just view this as an excuse to, to throw the towel. Uh, we need to continue to, to do whatever we can to, to manage nitrogen correctly. We see here in 2015 and 2017, uh, Pretty much very similar precipitation and similar number of major events that resulted in nitrogen loss. Uh, also, uh, similar planting dates and temperatures. Uh, the question is then why in loading in 2017 was much more than 2015? Uh, when we look at the data a little bit closer, we noticed that April and May in 2017 had greater amounts of precipitation, about almost two and a half inches uh, more precipitation than 2015. That said, 2017 produced much greater yields than 2015. And typically good years for yield mean uh, good years for mineralization. Loss might be greater because more in, in the system, but um, soil's ability to supply nitrogen is a key and sometimes we tend to only look at what we apply. Here, even though we uh, lost more, we ended up yielding more grain. So mineralization sometimes overshadows what we do in terms of management. In 2016 and 2018, uh, we see similar amounts of precipitation. These were both wet years, but 2016 had less loss because precipitation was more evenly distributed. Also in June 2018, we received around four inches more precipitation than in 2016. In May of 2018, we had much warmer temperatures than 2016 that likely enhanced mineralization and end loss is not just um, from the applied nitrogen, but it's also any nitrogen that is in the system, including nitrogen that uh, was in the organic form and mineralized during the growing season. And in both years after the split application, there was substantial rain soon after the application uh, before the plants could really take advantage of that application and that resulted in a substantial amount of nitrogen loss. And here we see um, the, the same kind of data but for 2019 and 2020 as until uh, this week, August 10. And um, again, we continue to see very similar patterns. Uh, 2019 was extremely wet and we see a substantial amount of uh, nitrate loss compared to uh, 2020 where conditions have been uh, very good uh, for retaining nitrogen. And here we see the um, total uh, results for the different years. We see that both for the load and the uh, the flow weighted uh, concentrations, the years were substantially different and this is uh, what one of the major things that uh, we need to remember that uh, the growing season conditions really drive uh, nitrogen loss. And then uh, when we look at uh, nitrogen load, we find that uh, ESN uh, pre-plant was the one that reduced the leaching uh, load the most compared to the standard urea pre-plant application and we also noticed that the split applications uh, made no difference in reducing uh, total load. Another environmental measurement that we are conducting is nitrous oxide emissions. This is a very important uh, greenhouse gas. It has about 300 times more 
uh, warming uh, retention capacity than CO2. And so we are conducting these studies throughout the growing season. We take uh, samples at uh, zero, 30, 30 minutes, one hour, and one and a half hours after the deployment of these uh, chambers that you see in the pictures. And we do that about three times a week at the beginning of the season, and then we slowly uh, reduce the frequency, but we do that through the whole growing season. And then uh, along with these measurements of nitrous oxide, we look at soil moisture and temperature, soil bulk density and the air temperature. And here we see the uh, results uh, for 2018 and 2019. We only have two years of data right now. We are collecting more this year in 2020. And um, as I mentioned, this is uh, a very important uh, environmental uh, measurement. Agronomically, it makes very little difference because you can see that at most we lose about six pounds of nitrogen per acre, which is uh, agronomically will not make any difference, but environmentally could be very important. And uh, we see in the data clearly again that uh, that pre-plant application of urea is the uh, the one that has the highest emissions. Uh, in 2018, the uh, ESM pre-plant application had the lowest, whereas in 2019, it was similar to the split applications. In here we see the uh, the cumulative results uh, for 2018 and 2019, and then the average across the two years. And uh, statistically, we see that ESM preplant had the uh, lowest uh, emissions, and urea preplant had the highest. With the split applications, again, as we've seen in other measurements, having kind of intermediate uh, values and that were not significantly different than the preplant treatments. In here, we uh, are also looking at in this study at uh, ammonia volatilization. This is again a very important measurement for environment, environmental reasons, but it also has implications for agronomic concerns. Uh, we can lose quite a bit of nitrogen that is not only damaging to the environment, but it's also a substantial amount of nitrogen loss that can impact yield and return on the investment. And so these uh, measurements are done at, uh, at the moment of nitrogen application and then 2, 4, 7, 12, 14, 21, and 28 days after the pre-plant application and again after the side dress fertilizer application. Those pictures there show the, um, the chambers that we use. Basically, we have foams impregnated with um, uh, an acid that results as a trap for ammonia as it reacts with the acid, it remains or it stays in that foam. And then we extract those foams and measure the amount of uh, ammonia that came out of the, the soil surface. In here we see the uh, results for uh, this ammonia cumulative loss. And uh, I present here the, um, the the time of site dress application. This is very important because as you we can see here, uh, in both years there was, uh, for pre-plant urea, there was substantial amount of loss uh, early on, but then it really just, there is no more loss um, later in the season. But uh, the uh, site dress application, once we apply that second dose of, of nitrogen, that's where we see a substantial amount of loss in 2019, both uh, split applications had substantial loss. In 2020, uh, we saw that only one of those treatments had a, a huge amount of uh, um, ammonia volatilization. And so this is uh, preliminary results at this point. We are still working quite a bit with it. But uh, again, we see that the, the split application seems to have actually uh, a limited uh, benefit uh, for reducing these um, nitrogen losses. So this is a very quick uh, summary of seven years of research. And one of the things that we see here is that uh, nitrogen loss is uh, very much related to precipitation frequency and uh, quantity, as well as uh, soil temperature. And this presents an interesting challenge, I think, in terms of uh, nitrogen management given the uh, changes in climate that we are experiencing. 
But I think uh, moving forward, we definitely need to be looking at uh, agronomic uh, outcomes and management decisions uh, based on weather variables. We observe that ESN, uh, at least as a trend in some situations, uh, had a more consistent benefit uh, in reducing nitrogen loss and increasing grain yield, but split applica applications did not really seem to improve yield or minimize environmental losses, even though um, in theory, they they would they should work better. We really have not seen that benefit, and so I think that as we move forward, we need to continue to look at uh, creative solutions uh, that are actionable, that are possible to be done in the field. We also need to accept failure along the way, uh, because sometimes we can be doing everything correctly and still. Um, extreme precipitation events, for instance, can really erase everything that we are trying to do. And uh, I think we need to continue to integrate soil, climate, and cropping systems as we improve nitrogen management. Finally, I would like to uh, thank you for your attention and also um, acknowledge the uh, several uh, agencies and uh, groups that have supported the, um, this research, AFREC, the Agriculture Fertilizer Research and Education Council in Minnesota, uh, Nutrient, uh, the uh, Foundation for Agronomic Research, and the Fertilizer Institute. Hello, my name is Brent Dizel. I'm a research scientist with the USDA ARS in St. Paul, Minnesota. Uh, and prior to that, I was a research associate in the Department of Soil, Water, and Climate in St. Paul, along with uh, Dr. Jeff Strzok. This is some work that we've been working on for the past few years. Uh, and specifically, I'm going to talk today about evaluating the Minnesota Agricultural Water Quality Certification Program conservation practice impacts on water quality in the Cottonwood River Basin. This work was funded by the Minnesota Department of Agriculture, specifically the Clean Water Land and Legacy Amendment funding. Uh, and I want to take a moment to acknowledge my colleagues at MDA, Heather Johnson and Bill Fitzgerald, Peter Gillitzer, and Brad Redland. They were really helpful in many aspects of this work. And I also want to acknowledge um, that this work builds off of previously funded research that was funded by uh, the National Science Foundation, as well as work that was funded by the Minnesota Corn Research and Promotion Council. This is a picture of the Cottonwood River near its confluence with the Minnesota. This is in Flandreau State Park near New Ulm. And when you stand down here at the water's edge, it's almost easy to forget that most of the land use in the Cottonwood River Basin is comprised of corn and soybean row crop agriculture. Uh, and that has a really important impact on water quality of the cottonwood and subsequently water quality downstream in the uh, Minnesota River and also the Mississippi River Basin. This is important because the Minnesota Nutrient Reduction Strategy sets out ambitious goals for reducing phosphorus and nitrogen loads into the Mississippi River and much of the projected reductions that we need to meet in order to achieve our goals uh, come from changing practices on Minnesota's croplands. This program is administered by the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. It encourages conservation practices throughout Minnesota by providing technical support for farmers, help them implement farm specific conservation practices. In exchange for participating in the certification program. Farmers receive regulatory certainty for a period of 10 years following their enrollment. So if environmental laws in Minnesota change in that time period, their farm is already deemed to be in compliance with environmental laws. The certification program has hundreds of farmers and hundreds of thousands of acres enrolled across the state. One thing that the certification program does not include 
is on-farm monitoring of environmental runoff. That would be cost prohibitive and labor intensive. But still, we wanna know how can we quantify water quality benefits of the Minnesota Egg Water Quality Certification Program. One way to quantify those benefits is through watershed scale modeling. In this study, we use the SWAP model, which stands for Soil and Water Assessment Tool, to simulate a variety of agricultural management practices under varying weather conditions across the watershed. The SWAP model is commonly applied to agricultural landscapes and is suitable for simulating environmental runoff both from overland flow and also subsurface tile drainage, which is important for simulating water quality in the Minnesota River Basin. The SWAP model is capable of simulating many different components of the hydrologic system and that's useful for us because the model can then help us to make sense of data that we measure in the field at different points across the agricultural landscape. Input data requirements for the model include spatial data like soils information, topography information, as well as land management information. In a large watershed like the Cottonwood, it would be impossible to collect detailed farm level management information for all the farms in the watershed. So a typical approach in watershed scale modeling is making assumptions about typical practices that are common in the watershed. This information comes from farmer surveys, weekly crop reports, expert knowledge, and stakeholder interviews. Typical management data is combined with data from a variety of additional field-based sources in order to calibrate the model and ensure that the model is representing processes in the watershed accurately. Once the model is calibrated, we apply those model parameters to a nearby watershed in order to ensure that the model is behaving in a robust manner. Here, we calibrated the model on the Cottonwood River Basin, and we have validated the model on the Redwood River Basin. But again, the model was calibrated based on management information that's assumed to be uniform across the watershed. We know because of programs like the MEWQCP that there are many farmers across the state who are applying conservation practices to their own farms. And so we wanted to set out to quantify the water quality benefits of the practices on these farms. Because of the certification program, we have farm specific management practices for selected farms throughout the watershed. This allows us to characterize what conservation practices were in place on these farms prior to their enrollment in the certification program, as well as what practices they adopted as a result of, the, of their interactions with the certification program. This includes fertilizer application rates, tillage practices, presence of other practices like grass waterways, cover crops, wascobs, or water and sed sediment containment basins, and replacing open tile inlets with blind tile inlets. In order to incorporate this farm-specific management information into the model, we needed to make some changes to how the model was set up in order to track each individual enrolled farm separately. The model keeps track of information based on differences in land use, soils information, and topography. After breaking down that information into its constituent group, the model representation of the watershed might look something like this with cropland shown in the brown colors here. But that does not reflect the changes that we need to keep tra track of for the certification program. In order to accomplish that, we added farm-specific identifiers to all certified farms that are located within the watershed boundaries. Including this identifier allowed us to keep track of very specific information on each certified farm in the watershed. And this was very valuable to us. In this example, I'm showing field scale nitrate export from this particular farm over a 10 year period from 2004 to 2013. In this example, management is constant throughout this period. And so all of the changes in annual export are the result of differences in weather patterns over the study period. We can apply this approach to the entire watershed, as well as for the specific certification program farms. And by doing that, we can get 
farm specific and time specific information about field scale export of nitrates, phosphorus, and sediment. A couple additional details about our approach. Uh, management practice changes were only evaluated on cultivated land. There is some certification program land that's classified as either pasture or conservation cover like CRP. We didn't simulate any changes there. And environmental outcomes from the certification program enrollment were simplified here to focus on one to two key management changes per farm. For this presentation, we are showing average annual values of sediment, phosphorus, or nitrate export for a 10 year period from 2004 through 2013. Each farm was given an arbitrary identifying number to keep track of information from one farm to the next, but no additional identifying information is given. We ran three sets of management scenarios for each certified farm in the watershed. In the baseline landscape, we assume management to, to mirror typical management across the entire watershed. That's shown here by the black diamonds. We also have farm specific information before they were enrolled in the certification program. That's shown here by the orange triangles. And finally, we have farm specific information for sediment or nutrient export after their enrollment in the certification program. And that's shown here by the green circles. Additionally, we list what conservation practices were on the farm prior to enrollment in the program. Those are listed on the right side. And you can see here in this example that this farm had conservation cover and a grass waterway. And the new practices in place are listed here next to the data points, and that is the installation of a blind tile inlet and fertilizer management practices. This figure shows average annual sediment export for all the certification pro program enrolled farms in the Cottonwood River Basin. While there are a lot of data here, there's a couple key messages to take away from this. One is that there is a lot of farm to farm variability in the degree of sediment export that occurs from these, from these fields. That's typically the result of differences in soil characteristics and topography, and also in management practices. Two, the baseline landscape the management practices that are assumed to be typical across the watershed are the black diamonds and occur on the right side of this figure, while the certification program or the post-certification program data, the green circles, occur to the left. So in comparison to a baseline landscape, most of these farmers are already impl implementing conservation practices on their farms that are achieving reductions in sediment export. In response to their enrollment in the certification program, nearly all farms achieved further reductions in their sediment export. This was most notably achieved through management practices like installation of blind tile inlets and also water and sediment containment basins. This figure shows average annual phosphorus export for the same farms in the Cottonwood River Basin. We see similar trends here where there's a lot of farm to farm variability but in general, the baseline landscape, the black diamonds, exist on the right. In some cases, the pre-certification condition is very similar to the baseline landscape. But in all cases, the post-certification condition, the green circles, occur far to the left and show the benefits of installation of practices. Again, blind tile inlets and water and sediment containment basins doing, um, achieving most of the water quality benefits here. The story is slightly different for average annual nitrate export. It is worth noting that relative to a baseline management scenario, all the certification program farms exported less nitrate under the pre-certification and under the post-certification simulation scenarios. However, there are some scenarios, in particular installation of the WASCOBs, the water and sediment containment basins, that resulted in the models simulating less surface runoff but greater infiltration, which subsequently produced greater volumes of tile drainage. In those scenarios, nitrate export increased as a result of practices associated with enrollment in the certification program. It's also notable that the farms that have conservation or that have cover crops in place 
see dramatic decreases in nitrate export relative to the baseline scenario. Even following installation of WASCOBs, they're still showing dramatic, they're still showing some of the least amounts of nitrate export among the farms in this watershed. To summarize everything just one more time, the certification program farmers are already implementing conservation practices on their fields. In this figure, we can see that by the orange bars existing at, at relatively less rates of sediment, phosphorus, and nitrate export than the baseline condition, which is indicated by the gray bars. Certification program changes to farm management resulted in dramatically further reductions in both sediment and phosphorus export. But some of those same practices actually resulted in slight increases in nitrate export, most notably through inc increased tile drainage that came out of the WASCOP scenarios. Overall, this approach allowed us to compare management scenarios across certification program farms to, quarter, to quantify the water quality benefits that have occurred as a result of enrollment in this program. This approach and these results can help us to set realistic expectations for water quality benefits from program enrol enrollment, and they can also help us to direct efforts for more farmer recruitment. If more detailed information does become available, we can include that in this approach for example, expanding this along with some economic analysis to help decide where limited conservation dollars can be most effectively applied. Thank you for your kind attention. Okay, so we're at the point now where we'll be going in and um, using Slido to uh, take a look at uh, questions that people are posing. So if you're, uh, if you're, uh, able to get into uh, Slido, uh, go ahead and um, start typing some of your questions. And um, there's one here for Fabian. Um, Fabian, um, so the question is, uh, was the split applied N uh, applied with an inhibitor? Yes, uh, can you hear me, Jeff? I can. Yes, so that, that's a really good point, and I think something that maybe I forgot to mention, but uh, yes, we did apply the split application since it's, it was broadcast and left on the soil surface. We use uh, uh, urease inhibitor. We use agrotain for that split application. For the pre-plant application, it was all broadcast and incorporated with tillage. Excellent. Thanks, Fabian. So there was another question uh, related. Um, so uh, asking whether you guys were planning to total up all of the end loss pathways and calculate an overall end balance for each one of those treatments. So obviously, I guess the question is looking at, you know, uptake into the plants, um, loss through the water, and then all of your atmospheric uh, measurements. Yes, that's uh, definitely um, one of the things that we are looking into uh, doing. This, uh, this presentation actually was kind of the stepping stone to get us going in that direction. Uh, Sonia Menegas, my co-author in the presentation, is doing her master's degree. And uh, we started this project in 2014. She came on board, uh, I don't know, two, maybe three years ago. And uh, we started adding some of these measurements and the plan is to uh, incorporate all the plant uptake we have in season and post harvest uh, total nitrogen in the plant and in the grain. We have uh, several measurements of soil nitrogen, ammonium and nitrate in the season as well as post harvest and then all the measurements of uh, nitrate leaching and uh, gaseous losses. So the plan is to kind of do a, a whole budget with all of these numbers to see how much uh, is retained, used by the plant, or, or lost. Okay, uh, well, 
Fabian, somebody typed in another question, but what I'd like to do is um, just take a moment and remind everybody, uh, you can go into uh, slido.com and it will ask you for a, um, uh, a login essentially for our meeting and you type in the number seven and then soil water typed after it and you'll be able to get to this site where you can pose questions. Um, I want to jump to one that actually I had for for Brent um, related to his presentation and and um, want to actually uh, comment uh, uh, for everybody um, that if you need to get to uh, Slido and eventually evaluations, you can look in the chat and I believe Emily is posting the link there that you can uh, go to. Um, uh, so a couple things here. Uh, one, my apologies for all of the, the initial technical difficulties. I think we've got those worked out. Um, secondly, uh, thank you both for great presentations. Um, but I have, a, I have a quick question for, for Brent. And Brent, the question is, is um, when you were looking at the, the certified producers um, nitrate data. Um, did the model, was the model able to take into account um, the amount of water stored uh, in those uh, reservoirs um, that may have been put in there for sediment retention? Um, it seems like maybe if there was more nitrate loss that it was it was allowing the reservoirs that they might have to fill up and then export some of that nitrogen. Um, is that how it kind of worked or, or what would have been the other mechanism that the model was using that the nitrate would have gone on? Brent, we can't hear you. Uh, you might have to unmute yourself. How about now? Is that any better? Uh, now we can hear you. All right, let's try this. Um, so essentially what the model was doing was um, with the Wascobs, it's, it's representing that as increased infiltration. So you get a reduction in that surface runoff, but when you, when you put more water into the soil, it has to go somewhere. And if there's tile drainage present, um, it, it simulates that coming out through the tile lines. Um, so that's that's why that's why we see that increase in nitrate export. Now, one thing that the model isn't doing in this Wascob representation is allowing for denitrification to occur in those in those basins. Um, that's something that um, we can do, but requires a little bit of additional work with the model. The model is not well set up to simulate those those biogeochemical changes in the Wascobs just yet. But that's that's actually part of some other code changes that I'm working on related to a different project. Okay, great. Uh, we, had, uh, we had another one uh, here, Fabian. Uh, some, someone was asking if you could give a little bit better or more in-depth description of soil types, depths to water tables, those types of things for the, the experimental site. Yeah, so this is um, the soil we have is a Webster and so it's a poorly drained soil, um, you know, glacier till kind of soil um, with uh, it, it does get saturated uh, during the wet period of, of the year uh, to about, uh, oh, I don't know, um, the top 12 inches or so of the soil. Um, and uh, it's, it's a very fertile soil, has high organic matter content, about 5%. Uh, it, it does have a, you know, pair material that uh, high in carbonate, so the pH is about uh, 8. And it's a very productive soil. Uh, I don't know if that covers uh, the question or if there are any additional uh, points. But it is certainly a poorly drained soil that requires a drainage in order to be uh, productive. No, I, I think that uh, based on what I was reading on the uh, Slido, and I presume you can see those questions as well, um, uh, that that probably is sufficient. Um, if anybody else uh, has a, a question that they want to, oh, oh Lindsay's got one here. Um, 
So Brent, uh, oh, so this is a, oh, that's a great question. So have you had a chance to share any of the results with any of the farm farms where you obtain that data? And um, uh, so then if you did, uh, do you think that anybody might uh, add practices? And I guess, you know, maybe Lindsay's kind of thinking too, that was pretty dramatic with the cover crops. So um, Brent, have, could you answer Lindsay's question? That was a, that's a good one. Yeah. So, um... The short answer is no. Um, we haven't shared that with with the individual producers yet. A lot of these results are fairly fresh, and um, uh, I think what we would do is probably go through our MDA colleagues first and see um, and see if they have any, I guess, feedback on these results before we go back to the individual farmers. But yeah, I mean, the cover crop changes are certainly dramatic, but also just looking at at the data that Fabian showed, you know, if we could just put ESN on those farms, I was I was amazed by the the reductions in nitrate loading that, that occurred with that. Yeah, that, I, that's a that's a good answer, um, Brent. And I, I guess one of the things too that I sort of echoed and 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 you know again something that you know we probably all as researchers need to do a better job of, even though none of us are economists, is to kind of keep some of those economic uh, questions in mind, you know, related to uh, to cost. Um, so you know maybe Fabian, you might. Uh, have some thoughts on that as well, at least in maybe just a very general, vague um, sense of how much how much difference in price there is in terms of ESN versus the urea and the split applications. Um, and then Brent, a, a separate question um, for you is, is: Does the model take into consideration um, when when you're putting in cover crops? Does it assume that the cover crops are planted and grow well? I know sometimes we have challenges. Um, you know, we've had some wet falls where it might be hard for farmers to be able to get out there and get everything growing, you know, perfectly well. Um, so does the model, is the model able to deal with that? So uh, Brent, why don't you go first and then Fabian, why don't you maybe think of a, a little bit of a quick response to that economic question I had. So for the, for the cover crops in the model, they grow as well as the weather allows them to. So there is, the model does pick up a lot of interannual variability. Um, and some years it's great and other years it's, it's not so much. And, and that, that gets reflected in terms of the nutrient uptake. I guess the, the cover crops, you know, at least according to the model, they work two, to, two ways. One, they take up that available soil nitrogen, um, but two, they also reduce tile drainage volume. Uh, and, and so there's kind of a dual benefit. And, and if, if the cover crops don't grow, then that dual benefit goes away pretty quickly. Yeah. Thanks, Brett. That gives that. I mean, I think that helps provide some clarification. You know, there's a lot of nuances with the models and modeling, and and I think uh, you know it's it's good to be transparent. So thanks. And then, yeah, uh, Fabian. Oh, add, go ahead. There's, there's just so there's so much of. I mean, you know, I can model things six ways till Sunday, but but so much of value from those kinds of exercises comes when you have like real world data that you can pin it up against. And so um, the availability of kind of long-term, you know, plot and field scale studies is really important for kind of making this whole thing move forward in a way that you can get good engagement with funding agencies, but also with stakeholders and producers. Yeah. It, it, so what you're saying is it gives a high level of confidence in that information when you've got that extra data. Yeah. You got to do it both ways. Yep. Yeah. Okay, Fabian, why don't, uh, if, if you could uh, just throw out, because again, I'm, I'm thinking a little bit about economics because people might be saying, well, you know, that's great, but it costs twice as much for ESN or, or whatnot. So, yeah, um, you yeah, know, that's a really good point. And um, unfortunately, I don't have it on fresh on top of my mind. Uh, Sonia, my student in the program, actually did some um, comparisons about a year ago. And so I'm going off memory here, but uh, the, the bottom line was that, yes, ESN is more costly than urea, uh, but then because of the uh, increase in yield that we got with ESN, basically it covered for that additional cost. So on, in terms of return on the investment uh, or returns, uh, it was comparable to the pre-plant application. So the, and the other thing to remember is that in here in this study, because we were limited in the number of treatments, we ended up applying 100% ESN, which may not be what uh, a typical farmer may do. 
but, but again, even using the 100% ESN treatment as a pre-plant, because of the increase in yield, it was sufficient to cover the cost. Um, the uh, split application was more expensive. Uh, I don't remember uh, off the top of my head the, the, the additional cost. And um, the challenge was that we did not really see a yield increase with the split application. And so that's where uh, it kind of lagged behind. But uh, this is certainly one of the things that Sonia is planning to do. Uh, she's trying to wrap up her, her thesis uh, next year, uh, where we'll be doing a more in-depth uh, economic analysis of all, all of these uh, treatments. Thanks a lot, Fabian. That was that 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 was immensely helpful. And I think you know, just in trying to, like I said at the very beginning in that one slide, you know, there are some advantages and disadvantages to things. And I think Brent's presentation demonstrated that where the wascobs were put in, and and you know, there was some additional nitrate uh, potentially coming out of those systems. And then you know, as you're pointing out, Fabian, uh, you know, there are some issues if you know because you had to put ESN on all at pre-plant, and it might not be the practice just because of some site limitations. Um, um, it's it's just good to have those uh, discussions, and and um, I appreciate your responses. Um, yeah. So if I may just for oh, a go second, ahead. Um, one thing that I think is important for us to to start looking into more in depth is that you know we don't have to treat every acre the same way. We can. Uh, use um, precision ag, for instance, to determine which areas of the field may need maybe 100% ESN. Uh, in other areas, it may be, you know, uh, a ratio of ESN and urea or things like that that, that may uh, help us economically and also achieve some of the, the, the other benefits that we are looking. Awesome. Well, thanks. I will remind you two to uh, to go ahead and mute your uh, mute your microphones, and uh, we will switch into group number two. Uh, in this group, we will have uh, presentations from uh, Andre Ranavasan and uh, Axel Garcia E. Garcia. Greetings, everyone. My name is Andy Ranevuso, and uh, my title of our presentation today uh, is uh, Biorectors and Heat Treatment Effects that was uh, conducted uh, for uh, the period of uh, 2018 and 2019. Uh, I have here uh, quite a number of colleagues and uh, co-authors. On the first line of the co-authors, we have uh, Myself, Dr. Strzok, Garcia and Garcia, all stationed in the Southwest Research and Outreach Center in Lamberton. The next line includes uh, Dr. Delzel, Ferizen, Mula, and Spokas, all stationed in the sample campus of the University of Minnesota. We cannot uh, forget uh, the uh, colleagues that work so hard in the field to make this research possible on the uh, third line uh, Mr. Coulter, Hovland and Hovland, Moody and Werner. Uh, we start with a map of Minnesota uh, that was uh, that came out uh, from a study by uh, Minnesota Pollution Control Agency in 2013. Uh, the title of the research is uh, Nitrogen in Minnesota Surface Waters, where they uh, pointed out on the problem we have with nitrate and nitrogen in general uh, from our state. In this research, they uh, monitored uh, 728 rivers and stream across Minnesota during a 10-year period. And they looked at the nitrate and nitrite levels in Minnesota, uh, rivers and streams, 2000 and 2010. 41% of those uh, uh, sites monitored across Minnesota exceeded 5 milligram per liter in concentration. So, and 27% uh, of those uh, sites exceeded the 10 milligram per liter. As you see here uh, on the northern part of our state, uh, there are uh, the blue dots uh, and toward the uh, south we have more red and uh, more uh, yellow as well 
and you see on the legend that the red would have a concentration range uh, of 10 milligram per liter and above, the orange or yellow, if you will, uh, range in the 5 milligram to 9.9. .9. So uh, the southern part of the city uh, definitely has a, a higher concentration of uh, um, nitrate from this map. And in general, 211 million pounds of uh, total nitrogen leaves Minnesota uh, each year in the Mississippi River at the Minnesota-Iowa border. And three-fourths of this load come from Minnesota watersheds, the rest come in from Wisconsin, Iowa, and South Dakota. Total nitrogen includes nitrate and nitrite, organic nitrogen, ammonia, and ammonium. So in general, our problem with uh, the nitrogen compounds and nitrate in particular, it come from the timing, the quantity, and the temperature. And uh, a couple of researchers pointed out uh, uh, this problem and uh, even titled their uh, uh, research spring flux of nitrate. So spring is a very challenging time for us to uh, take care of uh, the nitrogen in general. Here is the setup of our uh, site with the bioreactors. Here uh, we have an aerial picture. And there's a total of nine cubes. Three of those cubes are assigned as control. Three are under acetate treatment. And three are under acetate plus heat treatment. And uh, this statical setup is called the randomized complete block design, where we can control the effect of the treatment with replication under three different flow regimes. Uh, this slide is uh, showing the uh, second generation of bioreactor, uh, which is made up of a reinforced modular cube. And uh, they can be uh, located in uh, various field setup. Ideally, uh, it can be inserted directly under a drainage outlet if the ditch site geometry allows. And inside the uh, cube itself, there are several layers of materials uh, in the period of 2016 and 2017. Uh, we had uh, some uh, phosphorus absorbing material, some corn cob, wood chip, geofabric material, and some uh, red rock at the bottom. Uh, since uh, 2018, we uh, eliminated the phosphorus absorbing layer on top and I've replaced with more corn cob, and I'll uh, give you more details on that change on the following slides. This is a, a show uh, of the uh, setup for the cubes uh, to monitor the flow, the water quality, and what is shown here is the uh, flow system itself, the cube and the layers of materials inside, the automated sampling system that you see to the right uh, sitting on a, a shelf there. And underneath the uh, automated uh, sampler, we have a tipping baguette that measures the flow rate out of each cube. And now I'm showing to you a slide that uh, made us change the setup for these bioreactors. In, uh, uh, 2017 uh, going into 2018. So this is a, uh, a graph showing uh, two parameters. On the uh, left y-axis, you have the water temperature in uh, Fahrenheit degree. To the right uh, y-axis, we have the redox potential in millivolts. And what is showing here is that uh, as the temperature uh, in early June rose for about 12 degrees Fahrenheit, there is a sharp drop in redox potential uh, that was uh, measured in the field. And uh, this drop in uh, redox potential tells us that uh, there was some denitrification going on uh, more than what was observed before. 
And indeed, it was found that uh, the system re responds really well to a temperature effect. And that uh, prompted us to uh, change the setup uh, also that uh, the phosphorus uh, load reduction we attempted in the first two years, 2016, 2017, didn't work as well on the second year. So we uh, decided to move on and uh, make some changes. Redux potential uh, tells us about the uh, uh, kind of community of bacteria uh, inside the given system. For example, in the wastewater treatment, uh, the nitrifying bacteria will work between plus 100 and plus 300 millivolts. The denitrifying bacteria that we are interested in will perform between plus 50 and minus 50 millivolts. And that's what's happening here in this graph. So now I'm showing you the uh, kind of change uh, we uh, did to the uh, cube by reactors from the period of 2016-2017 uh, into 2018 and 2019. So uh, the layers uh, in the first two years, uh, we have on top the phosphorus rubin materials, uh, which were um, crushed concrete, limestone, and steel slag. Underneath, we have the corn cob, and then the wood chip, the products, it is a geofabric material that looks like sponge. And the very bottom, we have porous red rock. So what we did was just take away the phosphor, phosphorus for sorbine materials layer, and then replaced it with more corn cob. And the rest under the corn cob, the layers, we kept them the same. Uh, the other change that we made also is to put a uh, heating tape between the corn cob layer and the wood chip layer so we can monitor what uh, the uh, input of heat we're going to do. I'm going to show you in the uh, later slides how that is being done. But also uh, to the left, we see three arrows and those are loca location of the uh, thermocouples from which we can monitor the uh, temperature uh, throughout the uh, cube. So this is the uh, site when we started the uh, uh, heat treatment, added the heat treatment in the system. And uh, what we used is a uh, propane power generator. And we have the propane tank to the left here. And uh, we took three of the cubes and insulated them with some foam so the heat can stay inside and hopefully help the bacteria do the uh, denitrification. Uh, in the system. Before I go into some details of the uh, result, uh, I'll give you an idea of uh, the precipitation for the last uh, few years. This one is uh, 2015 uh, to 2019, and we had the cumulative precipitation. Uh, you can see clearly here that uh, three years, so 2016, 2018, 2019 were really wet years where the uh, amount of uh, uh, total precipitation in, in the year was above 35 inches, uh, while two years, 2015 and 2017, are relatively uh, uh, low uh, precipitation, um, 30 inches about. The 30-year average for uh, Lumberton is about uh, 27 inches. So we got uh, to deal with uh, uh, really wet years in 2018 and 2019. Uh, I'd like also to present the uh, hydraulic residence time for 2018 and 2019. The fact is that uh, hydraulic residence time is an essential parameter in this kind of uh, water treatment because the longer the water stays within the system, the bacteria have enough time to interact with the water and uh, do more denitrification uh, and eliminating more nitrate uh, that way. So uh, overall, on average, the uh, hydraulic this time in 2018 was a uh, two hour and um, 0.2. In 2019, 
in 2019 was just a little bit longer for 12 hours, uh, 0.82. So there's a difference of about 20% in the hydraulic residence time with 2019 having a little more time for the water to be in the system. Also, uh, we're going to start with the uh, presenting you the flow weighted concentration for two years. So overall, in 2018, uh, I call it SSD, that's the source water for the bioreactor. So uh, on average, we have 16.3 milligram per liter of uh, flow weighted concentration in 2018. And from the uh, the cubes themselves, the treatment cubes, you have 12.3 milligram per liter. So that is the uh, uh, average concentration in uh, 2018. For 2019, we see that uh, the concentration from the source is 13.9 and uh, the overall concentration from the cubes themselves is about uh, 8.6 milligram per liter because that, those are going to play a major role in terms of identifying the denitrification. Now, this is the uh, main uh, slide. I'd say if there's a take home, this is the take home. Uh, we can now uh, uh, think about the nitrate load reduction between those two years are represented here. And uh, overall, we had the uh, reduction of about 75%, uh, especially in May. That is a record. That's where I want to point it out that in 2019, the light blue, uh, we had this remarkable reduction and nitrate load reduction, 75%. There's a record for Minnesota. We haven't seen it before. And uh, overall, the uh, 2018 was relatively uh, lower than 2019, as you see here on the graph. And the fact is that uh, we run the heat treatment throughout the season in 2018 and less in 2019, but the results are really uh, striking here because we uh, saw more uh, nitrate load reduction in 2019 and I'm going to i show you why is that on the next slide. There is such a thing called the acclimation of microorganisms. Again, heat was applied for the entire season in 2018. Heat was applied in April and May, and then September, October in 2019. An average nitrate reduction of 35% in 2018, 49% in 2019, so more in 2019. Uh, the reason, possible reason for this uh, uh, difference, quite a big difference here between 2018 and 2019 is that uh, uh, the microorganism is going through a uh, process called acclimation. So uh, it's an adaptation of the microorganism when the, there's a change in the environment, in this case when applied the heat, but sometimes the bacteria community doesn't react right away to the change, but there is a delay. And this kind of acclimation, uh, we will preserve it in the first generation of bioreactors as well in Minnesota. Uh, the first two bioreactors that are horizontal beds were built in 20, uh, 20, 2007 but the effective nitrate load reduction occurred only in 2009. So there's a lag, there's a delay uh, for the uh, uh, bacteria community to react to the change. And the uh, last slide I'm presenting to you is related to that record uh, nitrate uh, load reduction in May of uh, 2019. So this is a little busy graph, but I'm going to walk you through. Of course, on the x-axis, we have the uh, the dates uh, in May, a little bit of April and May. Uh, so on top, we have uh, some light uh, color curves. And the one we need to uh, look at mostly is to 
is the what the, we call it the red one, the red curve, which is the temperature of the acetate plus seat uh, treatment. Uh, so that the record is a 15 minute, uh, or we uh, convert it into hourly nitrate uh, um, temperature. So we applied the heat treatment, and you see the difference between the control just and the acetate. Uh, treatment. So definitely there's a big hike in uh, the acetate and heat uh, temperature at about the, the beginning of the second week uh, of uh, May. At the same time, at the bottom we have some uh, black, gray, and then green uh, curve which represent the uh, control the acetate and the acetate plus heat. So the most important here is the uh, acetate plus heat uh, nitrate loads. And overall, what happened is that uh, during the May of 2019, nitrate load reduction was 22% at the control, 63% at the acetate treatment, and 75% at the acetate plus heat treatment. In conclusion, we'll say that uh, April and May are the two most challenging months for water quality in Minnesota. Flow is abundant, but the temperature is really cold. So the modular bioreactor was fitted to handle heat treatment and acetate addition. Heat was applied during entire growing season in 2018, whereas it turned it was turned on only during April, May, and September, October, and 2019. A record nitrate load reduction occurred in May of 2019, 75%. And in general, 2019 has seen a higher nitrate load reduction compared to 2018. Thermal acclimation may have played a role in the lower load reduction in 2018, where the nitrifying community and the heat put into the cubes uh, for the entire season. That is the uh, presentation I have for us today, and I'll be uh, happy to entertain name some questions. Thank you so much. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Axel Garcia Garcia. I am going to be talking about water use of crops in diversified rain-fed agroecosystems uh, this morning for you. I would like to acknowledge my co-authors, Dr. Xu Hui Liu from Taiwan University of uh, Technology in China, who actually did this work, Hannah Roche, our, one of our former students now at the University of Florida, and my colleagues uh, Greg Johnson and uh, Jeff Strzok. So basically, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the rationale behind this work and then um, our, about our results and finally uh, some remarks about our findings. <clears throat> okay, the first thing is um, why we have been doing this work. Uh, basically, as you may know, we are trying to develop uh, sustainable cropping practices for northern locations, uh, specifically for this part of the world. Uh, and one of the approaches is uh, the use of cover crops. Uh, this, this means we are trying to diversify uh, the corn soybean rotation practices. Um, but we are in a region where even though we have enough rainfall, um, basically, you know, if we put more crops into that rotation, we might eventually put at risk, uh, you know, the resources use of those uh, main crops. So we want to make sure that that won't happen, or at least we want to make sure uh, that uh, we know what could happen uh, with the use of cover crops in the corn soybean rotation. 
So we had three objectives. Um, the first one was to determine uh, if the use of cover crops seeded late into the corn and soybean growing season may affect the soil moisture uh, content and uh, the yield of the subsequent crop. And the other two uh, were to quantify the amount of water that is used by those crops, that means corn, soybean, and the cover crops. Uh, the study was conducted at three locations of the University of Minnesota uh, Research and Outreach uh, Center system. Uh, one was uh, up north in Grand Rapids, and the other two were at Lamberton and Wasika Research and Outreach Centers. Uh, we started this study in 2016 and we finished in 2019. Uh, our experiment was a randomized complete block design um, uh, in each phase of the corn soybean rotation. We had uh, three replications at Grand Rapids and four at uh, Lamberton and Wasika. Each one of the three locations had a different soil type. In Grand Rapids was a well-drained uh, soil. In Lamberton was uh, relatively well-drained soil and in Wasika was a poorly drained uh, soil. Our treatments were four uh, cover crop strategies. The first one was uh, cereal rye as a monocrop cover crop. The other one was a cereal rye with a combination of crimson clover, a mix of uh, cereal rye plus crimson clover. The third one was a three-way mix, cereal rye, crimson clover, and forage radish. And the last one was uh, no cover as a control. Uh, please notice that cereal rye overwintered and crimson clover and forage radish uh, winter killed, which means that uh, during the uh, growing season of the cover crops, in those treatments with mixes, only the cereal rye made its way to the next uh, spring. So the management was standard for all three locations. Corn uh, and soybeans were different uh, maturity uh, group in each one in, in up in Grand Rapids because it's a shorter season, but they were the same in Lamberton and Wasika. Corn was planted at 35,000 plants per acre. Uh, nitrogen application varied from 120 to 150 pounds per acre, depending on the location. And uh, we harvested mid-October. Soybean also was harvested mid-October. And actually, soybeans were planted at 150,000 plants per acre. Uh, cover crops were interseeded somewhere between uh, mid-August to the end of September. Uh, when corn was at R5, R6, which is at dent to maturity, and soybeans at R7, R8, uh, which is more or less when R7 is when soybeans start to drop its leaves, starts to yellowish, and R8 is maturity. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, we terminated the cereal rye in the next um, spring from end of April to end of May, depending on the location as well. And then we went ahead and planted the next uh, major crop. We collected grain for corn and soybean yields and biomass at termination time for cover crops yield. We also monitor soil moisture at different growth, uh, sorry, at, at different depths. Um, in the soil profile using a PR2 probe. The PR2 probe actually is a device that is uh, shown in this picture for you. And basically what it does is that it uh, measures the soil moisture at different depths just with one click by inserting that probe uh, into a previously installed access tube. Uh, 
Then also we monitor weather conditions using the automated weather stations in each one of the three uh, experimental sites. With all the data on hand, uh, our next step was to calculate the weather calculate the water use of, of crops and cover crops. So to do that we used uh, two approaches. One was a water balance and the other one was uh, a weather-based uh, calculation. The weather-based calculation uh, is a well-known procedure and we used the Pema monteith equation and uh, a crop coefficient that is determined by the FAO. Uh, and then to make it easier for the calculation of this ET0, we use uh, a software called SimDual KC, which basically uh, facilitate those calculations for us. And at the end, we had two sets of water use. One was from the water balance, and the other one was uh, for from the weather uh, data. And we use the, calcula the calculation from the weather data uh, to determine the two, comp two major components of the crop's evapotranspiration, which is evaporation and transpiration. And at the end, uh, we figure out a ratio that will allow us to uh, estimate those two components for the values that we got from the water balance. Then when we had all the results we use analysis of we perform analysis of variance and if needed regression regressions and uh, if significant differences we use uh, mean separation uh, with, uh, with LSD at uh, 0 0.05. Uh, weather conditions were quite different uh, in each one of the three locations, as you can see in this graph. Basically, you can see that uh, Grand Rapids was drier than the other than the other two locations. This is Grand Rapids, uh, this is Lumberton here, and then Wasika. Wasika was extremely wet, as you can see here, uh, followed by Lamberton, and as I said, Grand Rapids was slightly drier than the other two locations. Uh, within a location, uh, most of the time we had uh, excess water in uh, during this during the second part of the growing season, as you can see here, and here, and here. But uh, Again, uh, La, uh, Grand Rapids was the, the location where we had, let's say, slightly uh, drier conditions. Uh, what you can see here is are the periods when we had cover crops at the field. So we planted cover crops here and they grow in cereal rye over winter, I mean, went dormant here and uh, resumed growth here in the spring and then uh, it was terminated. During that period of time is when we calculated the amount of water that those cover crops were using. Temperature was also uh, different in each one of the three locations, but basically uh, if we look at each uh, from year to year, we can see easily in these graphs that uh, 2016 had uh, was the the warmest spring and also the warmest fall at all three locations, and it was the warmest summer at uh, Wasika as well. 2017, which is the light blue color, was quite normal. It was in the middle of each one of the of the other um, curves here, uh, and then 18 and 19 were quite cool. And again, again here, this is when we had our cover crops uh, planted and uh, in fall here, and then resumed growth and terminated during uh, during the spring here, so to go to go ahead and plant the next uh, major crop. 
Another way to see at this is looking at the kind of a climate balance. So what we have here is uh, cumulative rainfall and cumulative uh, reference evapotranspiration. The cumulative rainfall is the dark blue and the cumulative ET0 is or, or reference evapotranspiration is the light blue. So an easiest way to look at this is that uh, when the evapotranspiration is the cumulative evapotranspiration line is above the cumulative rainfall it means that basically we had probably a slightly drier year for example this is 2017 at Lumberton and the opposite if the rainfall uh, the cumulative rainfall line is above the cumulative reference evapotranspirations, it means that uh, the year was quite wet. This is the case in 2018 for Wasika, and as you saw in our previous slides, uh, that's what exactly happened. When uh, we have, for example, this year here, and uh, this year here, that was one in one in Grand Rapids, this one, and the other one in Lumberton, it's in 2016, that both lines are pretty much the same. It means, generally speaking, that the amount of water that we received from rainfall was good enough for vegetation growth. No, I'm not talking about just crops, but vegetation in general, because this is not the evapotranspiration of crops. This is the reference evapotranspiration or in other words is the amount of water that the atmosphere the total environment is uh, requiring from the system so looking at our statistical analysis for our results in terms of yield of crops and cover crop and uh, soil moisture and then water use of uh, crops cover crops uh, we can see that first uh, for yield uh, yield of corn soybeans and cover crops uh, was affected by year by location and by the year by location interaction you can see here okay and then uh, soil moisture was affected by the location uh, and the year by location interaction uh, it's interesting to see that uh, soil moisture was not affected by year and uh, that makes sense to me because basically um, it rained a lot so it means that whatever water was used by the cover crops which actually was not too much was uh, was then uh, replaced by the amount of rainfall that we receive in each one of the locations. Then, looking at the water use as well, we see that again, year and location had uh, a significant effect uh, on the water use of corn and soybeans, as well as the water use of the cover crops uh, during the fall period. Um, cover crops during the spring time, um, actually, the use of the water use of cover crops during the spring time was uh, not affected by year, um, but was affected by location. Again, what happens in the spring is that is when we basically see more rainfall going on. So, if cover crops use considerable water which is not the case in the spring the rainfall that we receive is going to be good enough just to replenish the soil moisture and finally uh, maybe you already noticed that cover crops have basically no effect on any of the uh, variables that we were assessing here and because of that the rest which is related to cover crops is basically non-significant as you can see here that uh, being said, I wanted to show you quickly how soil moisture look, looks like at seeding of uh, cover crops and 
a determination of cover crops. So these two one here for each one of the three locations. So these are the averages uh, for in the soil for profile for each one of the uh, locations we we had. This is the way to look at this is that. Uh, the farther you go to the right here, the wetter the soil is, and, and if you go down here, uh, you go deeper. So basically, uh, year after year, we can we can see that we had some uh, differences in soil moisture at uh, at seeding date and also at termination, but those were not really, um, how to say, they didn't differ considerably between year and year. And this is, uh, in this case, uh, so we are looking here at Grand Rapids. This is Grand Rapids, uh, seeding in termination. This is Lamberton, seeding in termination. And this is Wasika seeding in termination. Interestingly, you can see that at seeding in Lamberton and Wasika was we, we we had some differences. But if you can see uh, at termination again, that's during the springtime. Basically, every single year, most during the soil profile was very similar. Okay, that takes us to our yield results. This is interesting because. If you look at first here, uh, the cover crops yield, which is uh, the biomass of those cover crops, is here. You see that in Grand Rapids in, 20, in fall of 2016, we had considerable uh, dry mass uh, biomass, dry biomass, and obviously it was significantly different, different to the other two locations. And then if you look at the other um, uh, periods when we took biomass such as spring in 2017 then fall and the spring of 1718 and so on you will see that yes we have significant differences between locations but those differences are not necessarily important and I'm gonna tell you why and the reason for, for that is just because you can see here that the amount of biomass that we got from the cover crops is marginal. Okay, uh, so this is, we're talking here on 68 or 9 or even 2 uh, pounds per acre. That means basically nothing. Okay, uh, but they were different between locations and location. So what happened here is that uh, weather conditions were not favorable, favorable uh, to cover crops growth. And that was the, the reason why we got very low biomass. And this reflected, this poor growth uh, reflected into amount of water that those crops used to grow. And, um, and because of that as well, you uh, basically the grow the bio uh, uh, the yield of the major crops was not affected. The differences in yield you see here for corn and soybeans is just because the difference that we ha we got from one year to another. These are 17 and 18, so each one of those years was different as we saw previously in our statistical analysis. So there is a there is a year effect that uh, is pretty strong in this case. Looking at the results of water use, uh, this this graph shows you to the left the water use of cover crops. Each one of these bars has two colors. The blue colors color is the evaporation that means loss of water directly from the bare soil, uh, and uh, the orange part is the transpiration, which means is the amount of water that the cover crops actually used to produce uh, biomass. And uh, the sum of fall 2016 plus uh, spring 2017, uh, it will equal to the total amount of water that those cover crops use. Uh, the first one is uh, from Grand Rapids, then we have it for Lamberton, and uh, the last one is for uh, Wasika. This is uh, Wasika. Overall, um, 
cover crops use between two to four inches of water and when I said water uh, water use I am talking on evapotranspiration 70% of that evapotranspiration was uh, came directly from evaporation and then uh, for corn and soybeans which is the graph you see to your right uh, the water use vary between more or less um, 16 inches to almost 23, 22 plus something. Those, these ones here are averages because differences were not significant in between. So this, the, the main effect was year again. So what you can see here is 17 and 18, 17 and 18 and so on. Um, corn tended to use a little bit more water than soybeans, but they were pretty simple. So my final remarks here is that cover crops, if uh, interceded into corn and soybean late in the season, uh, will not have any effect on soil water content and the productivity of the major crops. Also, cover crops evapotranspiration was very similar among strategies, and uh, as I said previously, it ranged, ranged from two to four inches uh, between locations and years. Uh, those totals, from those totals, 70%, around 70% of, of the evapotranspiration of the cover crops uh, corresponded uh, to the evaporation component. And uh, last but not least, the average water use of uh, both corn and soybeans uh, was around 16 inches in Grand Rapids and around 20 inches um, in Lamberton and Wasika. Uh, these are, you know, general averages. In fact, uh, we got water use of uh, corn and soybeans as much as close to 23 inches. So my take home message is that uh, late interceded cover crops into corn and soybean beans uh, as long as terminated um, seven to ten days before planting and we go ahead and plant co corn and soybeans at optimum planting dates uh, will have no effect on soil water content and uh, the productivity of the major crops in the region. So that's what I had for you today. So I, today I, I appreciate your attention and uh, my, part of my of this research was supported by the MDA Clean Water Land and Legacy, and uh, the Minnesota Corn Growers Association and uh, the National Science Foundation. Thank you very much. Okay, so. Uh, in this case, uh, Andre and uh, uh, Axel, if you can uh, unmute yourselves for the question and answer. Thanks for those um, very interesting presentations. And uh, again, for everyone, uh, uh, Emily has uh, posted the link for Slido uh, in the chat box if you haven't gotten it open. And uh, please um, uh, throw your questions up there and we'll pose these to the speakers. And we've got one from Brent uh, Andre. Um, do you have the load reduction results summarized on an annual basis, uh, Andre, or expressed as area normalized loads? Uh, yes, uh, Brent. Uh, I do have the uh, load reduction result uh, as an annual basis. I've given you uh, only the uh, percentage reduction for now, but uh, yes, indeed. Uh, when the proceedings will be out, uh, you'll see that those numbers, indeed. I haven't uh, put them in area normal normalized loads yet, but uh, that is uh, feasible indeed. Th thanks, Andre. Um, there was another question for you. Um, so uh, the question was, what was the additional cost for heating the bioreactor? Did the difference in nitrate loading justify the cost? Yeah, the first one is that uh, indeed uh, we used uh, the light propane uh, fuel then to uh, make our, uh, uh, to put on the generator. Uh, indeed, it was uh, rather costly. Uh, I think uh, we loaded about three times and each load we paid somewhere in the uh, hundreds of dollars. Of course, that's uh, 
quite costly. But I think the, the main thing here, uh, because the research mostly focus on the, uh, uh, the outcome of the research, uh, not really the economic, but uh, uh, this year, we had the opportunity to use a, uh, a solar panel to uh, heat up uh, those uh, heating tapes. So we'll see the result. But uh, at least we changed the source of uh, uh, heat from uh, light propane uh, to a solar panel. So that will uh, cut the cost uh, quite significantly, I'd say. The second part, uh, difference in nitrate loading justify the cost. Yes, indeed. I would say for 2019 was just well worth the cost because this number I presented, 75% uh, reduction in nitrate is just uh, outstanding. And uh, I haven't seen that number yet, uh, at least for the Minnesota bioreactors. Thank you. So th thanks for that response, Andre. Um, uh, Taylor, I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, throw in a little bit of a, an additional um, uh, bit of feedback here, uh, based on what Andre just said. And one of the things that uh, you know Andre uh, showed was the idea of acclimation uh, of the the bacteria, the microorganisms in these systems. And it's not just necessarily the bioreactors. I, I would argue probably um, uh, anything that's biological is going to adapt and, and uh, acclimate to the conditions that it's in. And so um, we are actually working with some folks uh, with MinDrive to, to actually take a look at some of the microbial behavior in that particular system. And one of the other things that we've been toying around with, and we saw this, um, again, you know, in a short period of time for presentations today, you'll, you'll see this in the uh, proceedings, but um, one of the things that Andre didn't show was uh, the, some of the monthly data in terms of the real values, um, in terms of the load reductions. And what was pretty amazing was, is that the, the bioreactors that actually had the, uh, the heat applied, um, once we stopped the heat in 2019, uh, the, the, um, the reduction in nutrients from those bioreactors continued for several months to be considerably larger than the other bioreactor treatments. And so it seemed like there was definitely some carryover. So that's making us think about, um, you know, when we think about cost, uh, you know, can we use some sort of a, a pulsing method to uh, stimulate the, the organisms in those bioreactors and then shut the heat down? And then, you know, uh, you know, how much time do we need to heat? So we've got, we've got more questions to answer because we definitely think this could be economically um, uh, and, and certainly environmentally valuable. Um, I see a question from Alicia. Thank you for Axel. Uh, so this says, would you consider redoing the study in different areas to address more soil types throughout the state? Um, Axel, I'm supposing you have probably some uh, good information and responses to that. Uh, thank you, Jeff. And thanks, Alicia. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, thanks, Alicia, for the question. Uh, in fact, yes, uh, we would like to, uh, to expand this, uh, this research, but uh, there are a couple of things we are looking at. One is that uh, we would like to change a little bit our procedure. Um, and this is the thing, when we do calculations with, uh, you know, just, just a water balance, what happens is that there is a lot of uncertainties. Um, and then when we use, you know, the, just the weather uh, approach that I was talking about, uh, which is fine, we cannot look at much more specific things. So we are thinking that, this is the second one, that uh, probably the way to go to do this is using crop modeling. And as Brent said, uh, if we want to be successful uh, trying to get closer to the real world with the use of modeling, what we need actually is uh, good field data. Um, we already, we have already uh, gathered a lot of information for, from those three locations I was showing in this presentation, but uh, there is much more work to do. And I, I, I really uh, acknowledge that. And uh, another thing that uh, probably uh, it was not clear when I was talking is that these uh, results are specifically for uh, cover crops interceded late in the corn and soybean uh, growing season. Uh, 
So what happens in that case is that when we intercede those cover crops late in the season, basically there is not much effect or whatsoever in the, in the major crops because they are close close to or ready to be harvested. And in the next season, in the spring, uh, we terminate those cover crops when they are actually still uh, just starting to grow. So yes, we plan to continue with this. Thank you. Axel, um, there are, this, this isn't another question showing up on the screen, but I, I'd like to follow up just a little bit and have you elaborate maybe. Um, do you think, or have you had any experience with other, other different types of cover crop mixes or species? Do you think that other species, you know, there, I know that there has been work done, you know, here at the research center and other places related to, say, for example, um, pennycress and camelina. Would would those crops behave similarly to the mixes that you've used before? Would they? You think they would behave differently? Uh, yeah, good question, Jeff. Thank you. Uh, yes, we have some work uh, that has been done with uh, camelina and pennycress. And most of what we have done actually is with uh, camelina. Uh, this is the thing. Um, in some studies, including including some we had already done in my group, um, camelina and pennycress have been considered um, uh, as cover crops. And uh, so, what we should do is go ahead and plant camelina and pennycress in the fall, and then terminate if we want them to be as cover crops. Actually, terminate it before we go ahead and plant the next crop. Um, and use those camelina and pennycress without any input, without nitrogen and those kind of things, because the objective is to be cover crops. Uh, what we have found is that similar to the results I show you today, uh, growth of uh, those two winter oilseed crops is uh, pretty marginal in the fall, uh, but they do slightly better during the springtime. It all depends on one thing, actually. It depends on when we terminate the cover crops, no matter which type of cover crop is. Uh, for uh, What I'm trying to say is that we usually try to terminate the cover crops at the beginning of May. And this is just when the cover crops are starting to grow. Now, if we give cover crops an opportunity to grow, let's say at least a couple of more weeks, that will make a big difference. And then probably uh, the results I show today might be slightly different. Thanks, Axel. Um, so uh, I think what we'll do now, uh, we'll take about a, a six minute break uh, just for everybody to, that's out there online, uh, stop, get up, get your morning uh, coffee or stretch your legs or whatever. Um, and we'll reconvene um, at 1110 and we will start with the third group of presentations. Okay, everyone. Uh, hopefully, you're uh, you're making it back from your your uh, short little breaks. There, uh, we'll continue now with uh, the group three presentations. Um, again, I'd like to encourage everyone. Uh, um, we've still got a very healthy group of uh, people uh, in terms of numbers uh, online watching and. Uh, um, so I encourage you to uh, to use that uh, resource uh, on uh, uh, in the chat, uh, the the Slido resource uh, and the code there, uh, seven soil water, uh, to uh, pose your questions, uh, and we will get started. The next uh, couple of presentations uh, are by Ali Rashid Niyagi and uh, Jeff Strock, myself. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started with uh, Ali. Good morning. My name is Ali Rashid Negi. I'm a postdoctoral research associate at the University of Minnesota Southwest Research and Outreach Center. And today I will talk about the effect of supplemental irrigation practices on corn soybean yield, as well as the effect of supplemental irrigation on the drain flow from, from the plots and the soil nitrogen. But let me give you a, some introduction about our rationales, what we are addressing the supplemental obligation in this part of the country. So having resilience, as you may know, is an important feature for agricultural sustainability and food production. 
But increasing the extreme event frequency as well as changing the occurrence of those extreme events and amount of the precipitation would affect agricultural water management. Adaptation to the climate change is not an easy and, ex and it is inexpensive and requires significant improvement on water conservation as well as using soil potential, especially at this part of the country when we have a heavy clay soil with a high water holding capacity to overcome the precipitation limitation during the extreme summers. So as you see in these two figures here, the projected change in summer precipitation uh, for the future uh, tell us that we will have the much drier summers. But on the other hand, this projected change in the spring precipitation, especially for the early spring and the winter time, we will have the wet season. So we will definitely will face with the wet condition on the early season, which we will definitely need to have the drainage system. But on the other hand, we will have a dry condition during the summer that we need to find a water source to uh, supply our crop water requirement. So to address these challenges, there are several uh, options available for the producers and farmers, which one of them using the drought tolerant uh, hybrids or using the or at uh, or having the flexible planting date one of the ways is to uh, improve their water productivity and uh, when we are talking about the water productivity specifically here is to manage their drainage and manage their available water or accessible water and use them at the time that they need this figure here, um, you can see that uh, in the last couple of years, uh, especially in the Corn Belt, there are a couple of fields, mostly uh, experimental, are starting to take a look at the drainage water practices and also looking at the drainage water recycling practices and see how it can be benefited for the crop production in this region. So how this uh, works is they will uh, store the excessive water when it comes from the drainage or the surface runoff uh, as the storage or the pond that they created uh, close to their field. And by delivering those water through the sub irrigation or the supplemental irrigation or on surface irrigation, to their cropland, they can overcome their crop water deficit and the probable yield reduction. Also in the Northwestern Corn Belt, this uh, figure shows the trend of the precipitation that we had and the amount of the evapotranspiration or uh, evaporation and transpiration, which is the sum uh, of these two identify our crop wash requirement and uh, tells us that after uh, after planting the crop starting from mostly at this part in the May, uh, the crop is start to grow and the crop water demand increase, but the amount of the precipitation decrease. And we have the this amount of the deficit starting from almost end of the June until sometimes in the September, depending on the crop variation and depending on the climate change effect. So, it is very uh, important to address this, and by modifying the current practices, we can uh, improve our water productivity and address the agricultural sustainability. So the research plot that we studied in, uh, located at the Lamberton Research Station, and uh, that includes the 24 subplots, uh, which uh, also planted by corn and soybean rotation, 12 of them were corn and 12 of them was, uh, were uh, soybean with a randomized block design in the rotation. And each of those subplots uh, to 
to uh, uh, prevent from any uh, effect from the nearby plots and to have the isolated plots, it had uh, the plastic barrier down to the 1.8 meter. And uh, also they had a drainage uh, line at the 1.2 meter depth to drain the excess of water and uh, for experimental purposes, we can monitor those, those drainage uh, manholes uh, for each plot to see the amount of the water drained from each plot as well as the water quality. To monitor the soil moisture for, for the each plot, uh, we mostly use the almost middle of each plot and we use the PR2 soil moisture props to measure the soil water content at the six steps from the surface 10, 20, 30, uh, 40, 60, and 100 centimeter from the soil surface. So this table shows uh, the planting date and harvesting date and also the seeding rate for each, uh, each of the crops that we planted and the till tillage type and date and fertilizer application. For soybean, we haven't had any fertilizer and, and the soybean was, uh, because of the rotation, was uh, planted on the, on the plots that we had a core on its previous year. So it's almost used a residual one. If you take a look at the climate data, mostly precipitation and the cumulative precipitation in a millimeter for each each month of the studied year, uh, we can categorize the 2016 as a almost normal year uh, and the 2017 as a dry year, which you can see here, uh, it had the lowest amount of the precipitation for July and uh, the amount of the precipitation that we received in June and uh, as uh, almost low, not as low as 2016, but uh, it was low. So the cumulative of the precipitation in June and July, which is our crop productive and reproductive stage and close to the tasseling time at the end of the July, uh, we, we were facing a water deficit in terms of the amount of rainfall we received. But 2018 and 2019, both were a wet year, so uh, we haven't had any uh, problem to add the water in those years. However, we saw some yield reduction because of the excess water condition in the soil. So to apply the soil uh, supplemental irrigation, uh, we had uh, two different sets of uh, experiments that one is dedicated uh, for the soybeans uh, for a three different irrigation uh, treatment, which was excessive irrigation, full irrigation, and limited irrigation. And one plot that, uh, one plot remained as a rain feed condition. However, in this study, we uh, we excluded the excess one because of the uh, data uh, problem. And we only talk about the full limited and rain feed condition. And the amount of the irrigation that we uh, decided to apply for the full one was based on the soil available water and especially the soil uh, accessible water to the crop, uh, but for the limited one, the amount of the water that applied was similar to the full irrigation, but the time of the uh, application was different and mostly was close to the time that crop was uh, at the sensitive stage. Another measurement that we did was the drainage flow, the crop canopy temperature, uh, when the crop covered the ground to uh, to prevent from any black or back uh, temperature effect and the yield. So you can see here, this is the pond that the drainage water and the sub, uh, surface runoff collected uh, here. And uh, 
And we use this water that we collected uh, during the spring uh, time to irrigate uh, uh, our field, experimental field, uh, during the dry period of the season. And we use the subsurface drip system for irrigating the corn and soybean. And this plot here shows that how we managed it, for example, in 2016 and 2018. And for each treatment, we had a three reps and uh, to increase our sampling frequency, as well as uh, for the nitrogen application, we had a six nitrogen application from zero to 240 uh, pounds per acre uh, for the nitrogen application rate. So according to the statistical analysis, as well as you can see here in this figure, uh, during the time that we had the supplemental irrigation in July and August, so depending on the year, it, it was a little bit different, but mostly happened in July and August of the 2016 and 2017. You can see that for the rain feed condition, limited and full, how the soil water content at the 30 to 60 centimeter depths uh, fluctuated. And specifically for the full one, the amount of the water or amount of the soil water content uh, increase was significantly different compared to the rain feed condition for both corn and soybean. Uh, here you can see the three lines that we identified. The first one is the field capacity, which is the amount of the water available at the soil after uh, after the, the after a heavy rainfall and after the amount of the water that drained by the gravity. So the remaining water in the soil profile was called field capacity, which is the ideal condition for the crop. Another one was the lower limit was called permanent, is called permanent wilting point. And this is the, this is the amount of the moisture or this is the threshold that crop cannot, if, if it's reached to this point, the moisture crop cannot extract any water and it's almost dead. So, but the but the suitable condition for the crop growth was uh, is defined for uh, is defined based on the soil water content between the a maximum allowable depletion rate, which for corn, which is for corn, is fifty percent, and between this this threshold and the field capacity. So, uh, we are mostly interested to locate the soil water content at this range and about it because if we want to consider the soil water requirement for a couple of days, uh, we should consider those in our supplemental irrigation management. On the other hand, looking for the drain flow from the plots, we haven't seen any significant effect of the supplemental irrigation of full limited and rain feed on the amount of the drain flow. So, and this shows that our field was, uh, was dry enough and any water that we applied was uh, supplied uh, the crop water requirement. On the other hand, looking at the nitrogen concentration of the drain flu, we also haven't seen any significant difference between the full limited and rain feed condition for, for the month of the years that we had the uh, drain flu. So this shows that the irrigation or supplemental irrigation uh, did not have any effect on our uh, uh, drain flu or water quality. Or on the other way to say it, we can say that the irrigation did not wash the available nitrogen in the soil, which is, uh, which is very good for, uh, for the crop growth. Just as an uh, example, if we wanted to look at the soil nitrogen concentration for the different applied nitrogen rate and the irrigation, so this nitrogen rate are in kilogram per hectare, and uh, the nitrogen concentration in the soil, again, we haven't seen any, any significant difference for each nitrogen 
rate based in the full limited and range fit condition for the 30 to 60 centimeter depth. So the reason that we only look at this depth because this is the depth that the crop, especially after the growth, uh, uh, extract most of their required water for the productivity. However, by looking at the yield, uh, we we saw a yield increase almost for all of the uh, full and limited compared to the rain feed condition for the corn and soybean when we have the zero nitrogen rate. However, for some higher nitrogen rate, we saw some decrease and uh, some uh, very insignificant increase, which uh, we guess that this fluctuation was related to the each subplot own characteristics and the uh, need to study further. But what was obvious was the effect of supplemental irrigation on the crop temperature when we had the irrigation uh, that the plots which had the irrigation shows the lower canopy temperature compared to the rain fit condition, which shows that the crop was at the optimal condition and was transpiring in an optimal level and haven't had any uh, deficit or stress situation. Another advantages of the supplemental irrigation was, uh, was for core mostly. And if you compare, although, although the full limited and rain fit condition haven't shown a significantly different yield uh, compared to each other in total, but if you look at the minimum obtained yield, you can see the difference was significant. And we had the higher minimum obtained yield for the full treatment compared to the rain fit condition. So if you wanted to conclude that the irrigation or supplemental irrigation, although haven't show, showed the increase in the average yield, but uh, it's uh, increased the minimum amount of the uh, obtained yield and increased uh, uh, and, and decreased the variability in the obtained yield. So the conclusion, we can conclude that the relative small amount of the water, especially uh, during the mid season of the crop growth, uh, shows the significantly increase in soil water content. And uh, especially for 30 to 60 centimeter depths, which is a uh, critical depth for corn and soybean grows after a reproductive or at the reproductive and tasseling stage, as well as supplemental irrigation prevented the upper yield reduction, especially during the drought season of 2017. And by considering the full irrigation, we saw the increase about 34% in the top 20 centimeter of the soil water content and 18% for the 30 to 60 centimeter of the soil profile uh, water content compared to the rain feed condition. Thank you. And if you have any question regarding to the supplemental irrigation application and the benefits, you can contact me. Uh, from according to this information. Thank you. This research presentation is titled Low Grade Weirs as a Management Practice for Nutrient Removal in Agricultural Drainage Ditches. My list of co-authors and staff from the Research and Outreach Center uh, who have been instrumental in helping conduct this research are all listed below. Um, in particular, I would like to point out Andre Ranavasan, Mark Coulter, Ivan and Nolan Hovland, and Doug Moody. Um, this group uh, or members of my team uh, have been really, really instrumental in managing and collecting the data, conducting the analysis uh, to keep this project uh, moving forward. And I'm extremely grateful for all of their help. Our site is located in southwestern Minnesota at the University of Minnesota Southwest Research and Outreach Center near Lamberton. Um, our site is located within the Cottonwood River watershed, which flows past Lamberton to New Ulm, where the Cottonwood meets the Minnesota River. Uh, from there, the Minnesota flows to the Twin Cities, where it meets the Mississippi River which of course flows down to the Gulf of Mexico. 
This conceptual uh, figure uh, represents uh, some of the way that, uh, that we've been thinking about and conceptualizing the research that I'll be presenting today. So our idea uh, and what we believe is, is that in order to really make meaningful strides at um, improving and mitigating the agricultural impacts on water quality, um, we need to have multi-purpose drainage management um, and practices. Um, those types of things include in-field practices uh, related to the four R's, fertilizer management, for example, uh, would include perennials, uh, cropping system diversity, um, nitrogen management, things like side dressing uh, would be appropriate. And of course, cover crops are an important component of our research program as well. Next, we would think about uh, edge of field practices uh, where we see here we have bioreactors, um, wetlands, controlled drainage and saturated buffers. Uh, this takes us to another level. So as you see, when we move from just implementing in field practices, we have a fairly low percent reduction in nutrient loads. Um, but as we implement those and then add on edge of field practices, we increase uh, our uh, reductions in nutrient uh, loads from our systems and our watersheds. Uh, and then um, as we would move further beyond the edge of the field to the in-stream components where we're looking at ditches and reservoirs, um, by coupling all of these in a, in a treatment train um, or stacking all of these practices, uh, we're able to optimize um, our mitigation of uh, agricultural nutrient losses. To sort of drill down to give you a perspective of how uh, we've been conducting this work, um, we have a rather unique site at the Research and Outreach Center at Lamberton. Um, here we've put together um, a series of components of infrastructure in a small watershed to really take a look at um, agriculture, um, achieving agricultural goals in terms of productivity and yield, um, along with looking at improving our environmental footprint. So in this particular site, uh, we have infield cropping system management, which includes um, cover cropping, relay cropping using winter camelina. Um, we have an edge of field practice uh, where we have vertical modular bioreactors uh, that we are working with. Uh, we also have six constructed wetland cells um, that we've been working with. And then we also have this in-stream beyond the field uh, drainage ditch system. So the water that is supplied to all of these different components comes from our research and outreach center ag fields um, in the form of subsurface drainage represented by this red line and through these two grassed waterways that you see here uh, in terms of some of our surface runoff collection. So all of our systems, except for the edge field system here, um, are fed by surface and subsurface drainage. Um, the, edge of, the edge of field bioreactors are only fed by um, subsurface drain flow that actually flows into those. In this particular presentation, we'll be focusing on, focusing on the in-stream ditches. So to look at this a little bit closer, uh, we have two experimental channels right here in the middle of this diagram. We have a control, which is an unmanaged ditch. It's uh, uh, designed and, and uh, managed the same that um, the majority of ditches in Southwest Minnesota are. Um, the treatment channel, however, uh, on this side, uh, contains a, a minimally invasive low-grade weir toward the outlet. So here you can see uh, one of our research approach flume sections and this set of low grade weirs. This is only about 12 inches tall. Um, and in order to manage water behind this little check dam or low grade weir, um, we actually manage water by letting it flow over the top or through two small orifices that you can see here uh, that are at the base of the bottom weir. Um, you can see them a little bit more closely here in this other inset picture at the top where you can actually see water jetting out in these two locations. The reason behind this is that um, in between precipitation events, we 
we would like to optimize the amount of treatment that we have behind the low grade weirs by increasing the residence time of the water. Um, but we also want to be able to create a situation where we have some drawdown uh, of the water. So these two orifices here allow us to have slow drawdown um, in between precipitation events, which allows us if we have a precipitation event come after uh, a week or 10 days uh, in between events that we have some storage capacity uh, in that ditch, which will will minimize the amount of water flow out of the system. Our methods, as I've just stated, are we have uh, ditches that are with and without the low grade weirs. Um, the water that we treat in this system is a com combination of surface and subsurface drainage. Um, we're monitoring flow and also water quality parameters. Uh, you can see from the list here, we have several, um, but we're only going to be focusing on nitrate and dissolved reactive P for the purposes of this presentation today. I also want to mention that in May of 2020, we did a conservative tracer test. And the results of that work showed that the control ditch had a residence time. So the water was basically in that channel for about one hour's time from, from the inlet to the outlet. Uh, whereas the treatment, we had about a five hour residence time. Um, one hour and five hours aren't really long uh, in relative terms, um, but you know, an additional four hours of treatment time in the treatment ditch um, uh, can have some impact as we'll see on some of the results. I might also mention that we plan to repeat this tracer test uh, again during a lower flow period. May 2020 was a relatively high flowing period of time. To begin with, we need to kind of get a little perspective on our monthly precipitation. So this figure uh, shows us the annual monthly precipitation uh, here in this box where we had 763 millimeters in 17, all the way up to over 1,000 millimeters in 2019. So we had about 30 inches in 2017, 38 inches in 2018, and about 40 inches in 2019. Our long-term mean is about 695 millimeters, which is about 27 inches. When we look at the, the monthly distribution, you can see there's a lot of variability from year to year. Um, a couple of the main differences that we see from year to year uh, are in particular in 2017 uh, was below average uh, in February, March. Um, in 2018, we were getting close to the average uh, April was a little bit on the drier side. 2019, we had very wet period early in that season, uh, which of course contributed to the, uh, the flow that we saw through our, our ditch system. Um, you can also see that during these three years that we also had um, quite a number of periods during the growing seasons of 17, that would be between April and September, that we had above or well above the monthly mean for precipitation. Of course, all that water is the driving force which uh, makes our ditches flow. So to get into some of the data here, this is a summary of the percent change for discharge and then nitrate and dissolve reactive phosphorus uh, for our systems. So you can see the overall three year means uh, discharge, we had a reduction between the treatment and the control of about 57%. So what this means is, is that there was 50% less flow through the treatment channel compared to the control channel. Uh, likewise for nitrate, we saw 67% reduction on average over that three years uh, of nitrate uh, from the treatment channel compared to the control channel. And we saw a 27% reduction uh, over that three years for phosphorus. Um, you can see we have relatively consistent values for discharge and for nitrate nitrogen, um, dissolved reactive phosphorus, um, we had fairly consistent results in 18 and 19. However, 2017, uh, during fall, mid-October, we had a very large runoff event. And uh, up until that time, our treatment ditch had been uh, behaving as a sink uh, for phosphorus, and it was actually uh, coming in uh, as, a, as a lower percent um, uh, reduction compared to the control. Uh, however, uh, because of that large flush, flush of phosphorus that we had, um, that particular ditch became a source of phosphorus in 2017. 
Another couple of things that I want to point out here, this is uh, the annual summaries of the discharge, the loads, the flow weighted concentrations for nitrate and for dissolved reactive phosphorus. Um, you can see, of course, that we have quite a range of values uh, from year to year in terms of flow through the ditch system itself. We also see quite a difference in load. Um, really, uh, a lot of that is, is based on the discharge. So as the water goes, so does the dissolved nitrate. However, uh, what's really interesting to see from our ditch systems is that um, we also see uh, a relatively large percent reductions um, in, in the uh, flow weighted nitrate concentration between the treatment and the control. Um, here we're at about a uh, little more than 50% reduction here. Here we're about a 65% reduction. Here was about a 22% reduction. Um, so um, that's a pretty important point to make. Um, when we look at the loads for the dissolved reactive phosphorus, um, we're looking at relatively small amounts. These are in grams compared to the kilograms for nitrogen. Um, and uh, again, we see quite a range uh, really based on uh, the, the flow from those years. Uh, we certainly increased flow and then how the flow actually occurred. The flow weighted concentrations um, from the treatment uh, are, are, are uh, for 18 and 19 are, are less than uh, less than 100 micrograms per liter. Uh, that big flush that came through in 2017 is reflected pretty clearly in this data um, that we were uh, well over uh, 100 micrograms per liter. Um, but where we're not treating it, we're, we're hovering around that 100 micrograms per liter. Um, I've given some indications of these unit conversions. So we're looking at anywhere from a range of about 264,000 gallons up to over 10 million gallons of flow over that three years. And then a range of 22 pounds to 5,500 pounds of nitrogen uh, and less than a pound, about a half a pound up to 88 pounds of loss of, of phosphorus. When we start looking at the, the monthly nitrate data, this is just an example for, for 2019. Um, in March, we saw a relatively low amount of, of nitrate coming out. Of course, it peaks in April. Um, part of our, our hypothesis here is, is that uh, in March, we really didn't have quite as much drain flow. This was dominated by surface runoff. So the nitrate in the surface runoff was lower. Uh, but as the surface runoff uh, became less of a uh, contributor uh, during the month of April in 2019, uh, the subsurface drain tile took over. And of course, we see uh, our maximum concentration or maximum load coming out in April. And then of course we see generally a, a lowering trend um, across the months. July uh, was another month of relatively high flows in 2019. And of course we saw uh, a larger flow uh, or larger loads of nitrogen and phosphorus during those months um, as well. When we look at the dissolved phosphorus for 2019, um, of course, dominated by surface runoff in March. So we saw uh, much more phosphorus leaving the system uh, compared to April again, when, when we were more focused on uh, being uh, the thrust of the flow being uh, dominated by subsurface drain flow. And then of course we see uh, a bigger uh, flux of phosphorus through both systems um, in July. And of course we had flow in September and October of 2019. Um, the treatment channel did a, quite a nice job of mitigating the phosphorus loss, but the control had quite a lot uh, moving through that system. So to summarize here, uh, we had about a 50%, 57% reduction between the treatment and the control between 2017 and 2019. Uh, the 67% reduction of nitrate over that three year period. Um, on average, we see about a 27% reduction uh, over the three year period, uh, but it actually ends up being about a 64% reduction if you just look at the 18, 19 years um, uh, when we were not acting as a source of P uh, during those years. The monthly uh, N and P loss, um, uh, most of the P losses are happening mainly in March consistent with surface runoff and snow melt. Uh, April, we get most of our nitrate loss consistent with subsurface drainage. Um, 
Another observation that we've had is, is that uh, when we look at our data, um, for most months uh, where we have high flow volumes, we see the most phosphorus losses, which is consistent. Um, now, we don't have a, a perfectly great handle on the mechanisms of, of where all of this is coming from. Phosphorus could be sorption, desorption from some of the sediments. Um, we could see some changes in it related to nitrogen, related to denitrification. Of course, plants will take up nitrogen and phosphorus, so some of our, our changes in concentration and load reductions could be related to any of those three. Or it could also be possibly related to potential um, surface groundwater interactions where we might have some dilution going on. Um, but the thing that we really wanted to point out here is, is that there's minimal, minimal structural intervention with the ditch showed a significant water and nutrient reductions for our systems. Thank you. So uh, we've got, uh, got some time for, uh, for questions here. Um, we'll pop over and see what some of the anonymous ones are. Well, the more recent ones to get those back up. Uh, so this one is uh, for me, what's the scalability of our approach? Um, yeah, that, that's actually a great question. Uh, we've, we've tried to, um, to try to move from, well, let me, let me, let me answer it with a short answer. Uh, I don't have an exact um, precise answer for uh, whoever anonymously asked the question. Um, what we've tried to do uh, here is to, um, to, to sort of piggyback along with some of the work that Brent's been doing. So um, the, the, the work uh, that, that we've done on this small watershed uh, with, you know, essentially these practices in a small watershed um, are, are additional components that, uh, that Brent can uh, and will be actually uh, uh, including in some of the modeling. Some of the modeling he showed today uh, is also part of the same project. Um, and so, uh, you know, we anticipate that uh, being able to scale up um, to a larger scale that we would, we would hopefully be able to, uh, to see some of the same benefits. Um, you know, our ditch system is only about 650 feet long. We actually have uh, several nearby sites identified um, to, to look at uh, watersheds that are greater than our 300 acres. They're, they're more on the 2,500 to 5,000 acres with obviously many more tile coming in and those types of things. Um, we just haven't been successful, unfortunately, in getting um, external funding to support that work. So um, hopefully uh, over time, we'll be able to secure some funding and, and expand out to look at the larger landscape. Uh, Ali, there's a question for you. Uh, so the question is, could we say that supplemental irrigation may be an option to reduce your year-to-year -year corn yield variation in the region? So Ali, make sure you have your microphone on. Right. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, before I address this question, I forgot to appreciate all the people who helped in the project and uh, from collecting the data and instrumentation and uh, handling the data and also the agencies that supported that, uh, I believe it's transforming drainage, but, uh, and if there is another agencies, uh, Jeff helped me on that. And uh, regarding to that variation, uh, that's a good question because, uh, because in this specific study, unfortunately two years of the four years of the study was wet 2018 and 19 and we haven't, uh, able to apply the supplemental irrigation uh, to see the benefit. However, for for the years that uh, we are experiencing a dry summer, uh, the studies not only on this one uh, we use the unsurface drip tape, but uh, the another supplemental irrigation, just such as using the subsurface irrigation, shows. Uh, huge benefit uh, on, ter on the corn yield as well as the soybean yield by reducing the uh, variation and also increasing the yields in some point from 5% up to 30% depending on the, re depending on the uh, part of the country, but specifically at this part of the region, uh, we saw uh, in my previous study, uh, 
not specifically at the Lumberton, but uh, in the North Dakota and also in the Clay County of the Minnesota, we saw about 25% increase in 2017 uh, corn yield because of the supplemental irrigation. But uh, to, to, to make sure about uh, the final results, we need to expand our study to the different soil types and also uh, have a have a less climate variability and uh, experiencing a several uh, several years that we can apply the supplemental irrigation to see what exactly uh, the benefit of it. But but at the short term uh, study, yes, the supplemental irrigation shows to improve the corn yield or prevent the corn yield reduction and uh, reduce the variation of the corn yield. So Ali, uh, just uh, I've got a follow up, and oh, I see Lindsay just popped in with one too. Um, so, uh, do you think that it would be uh, advantageous? Uh, you know, Axel mentioned it in his presentation, and obviously Brent has done some of this. Do you think it would be advantageous to to do some modeling um, using some of the future climate projections? Uh, you know, even though the, the data is a little bit limited in terms of some of the benefit that, that you could actually model some of that and, and actually see what potential yield benefits might be. You know, we know that the weather patterns, you know, sort of cycle. We're in a wet one right now, but, you know, it could flip and, and be dry. And, and um, so what, what do you think about that? Yes, uh, that's, that's one of the goal of this study to collect the data and, um, Fortunately, the variation of the climate and having the, having the result of the different variation would be a very beneficial for modeling purposes. So, and uh, we, based on, especially adding this 2020 years, we have a five years of data and we can rely on that and develop the model uh, on forecasting. We have, we have roughly the estimation for the ET, because for the ET and crop wash requirement, we have a large data set for the region, but what we are missing is the yield so and the soil washer content. So by uh, by developing the models that would be a that would be another advantage just to to predict the yield and the predict the effect of supplemental irrigation over the time that would be much beneficial to apply the uh, irrigation to uh, to increase the crop production. Well, that's good. Lin Lindsay had a real quick question there for you, uh, asking about how the how the field plots look this year and um, if it's been more favorable for uh, for the experiment this year. Um, this year, yes, uh, it's at the uh, looking to the to the rainfall uh, events and the frequency as well as the amount of the rainfall. At the beginning, it seems it's a favor uh, it's a kind of a wet year, but uh, I think last, the last week, based on the soil moisture condition, we saw a little bit deficit uh, in the soil in the soil water content. Although it's a little bit late, so but uh, we 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 start to apply the supplemental irrigation, and we believe that we we, we will see the results or the effect of that that one or two twice irrigation on the yield this term, but. Uh, what what is more important about the effectiveness of the supplemental irrigation is the time of the year, mostly uh, in July, when uh, if we had a dry condition or the soil moisture uh, is not enough to support the crop water uptake, uh, that would be the much uh, important time of the year uh, to apply this supplemental irrigation, which enhance the crop production as well as enhance the crop nitrogen uptake and the accessibility to that, because these two, I believe it works together. So, uh, but this year we will see the results. It's, uh, it's not 100% favorable weather condition, but uh, we, we try to, to differentiate the results from the effect of supplemental irrigation and rain feed condition. Awesome, thanks Ali. Um, so I don't see any more uh, new questions in the Slido. So I think we'll go to our last group. Um, uh, you'll hear two presentations, uh, one from Lindsay Peace uh, and one from Jeff Strzok again. Um, we'll start with, uh, with Jeff's. 
My name is Jeff Strzok and I'm a soil scientist at the Southwest Research and Outreach Center uh, near Lamberton, Minnesota. My presentation is titled Constructed Wetlands as a Management Practice for Nutrient Removal. My co-authors are listed below along with the, some of the staff that uh, are instrumental in helping collect this, uh, this data at the, at the research center and I'm absolutely indebted to all of their help. For without them, we wouldn't be able to have this presentation today. As I mentioned, uh, this research is being conducted at the University of Minnesota Southwest Research and Outreach Center near Lamberton. Um, our site is located in, in southwestern Minnesota within the Cottonwood River major watershed. The Cottonwood River flows uh, through southwestern Minnesota to New Ulm where it meets the Minnesota River. Uh, and then it flows from southwest Minnesota up toward the Twin Cities where it meets the Mississippi River and then of course flows down to the Gulf of Mexico. This slide is a, a conceptual slide. Um, today we'll be talking a bit about uh, wetlands and constructed wetlands uh, and edge of field practice there in the middle. Um, what, we're, what we're really trying to look at is, is to think about load reductions uh, based on the, the types of practices that we're adding. We know that different types of practices have different potential impacts in and of themselves uh, on, on water and nutrients. Um, but here we're looking at it from the perspective of if we're only implementing in-field practices like the four R's, cropping system, diversity, cover crops, um, we can achieve a certain level of load reductions, nutrient reductions uh, uh, in our water. But uh, if we add on edge of field practices like constructed wetlands, controlled drainage, um, or bioreactors, we can increase uh, the percent or the amount of nutrient load reductions that we're seeing. And then of course, if we stack on top of that within a watershed, uh, some sort of beyond field in stream ditch or reservoir type of a system, um, and we can uh, optimize that uh, mitigation even further. To give some perspective, the project that I'll be talking about today uh, is part of a larger project uh, that we have going on at the research center. We have a rather unique site uh, that incorporates in field, edge of field, and beyond the field in stream practices. Um, we, uh, we have some infield uh, cropping system work that's going on with cover cropping and relay cropping of winter camelina. We have edge of field vertical modular bioreactors uh, that we're, we've been doing work on for a number of years, uh, along with the constructed wetlands, which is what the focus of this pr presentation will be today. And then uh, our drainage ditch system, uh, which is at the outlets of our, our site. Just a little bit of uh, detail on the constructed wetland facility. Um, water will flow in from surface and subsurface drainage into uh, an equalization area there represented uh, at the top of the figure. Um, and then it is allowed to be redistributed into uh, three different pairs of or styles of constructed wetlands that we've built. Um, we have a pair on the left that are designed as surface flow wetlands. We've got a pair in the middle that are vertical flow, and then we have a pair on the right that are horizontal flow. Um, water then, after it flows through those systems, is allowed to discharge, uh, flow through a grass waterway, and then ultimately to our drainage ditch site. This figure uh, just gives a, a side profile uh, of what each one of those systems looks like. So for the surface flow, we have a, a deep permanent pool at the one end, and then we've got a a uh, slightly shallower area and then an even shallower area beyond that, which allows sheet flow to happen and then water to flow out of the system. So in this particular system, we have uh, water storage uh, involved and incorporated into that design. The vertical flow system also incorporates uh, a level of storage, um, but this site is designed with three subsurface drainage tile that are, are narrowly spaced and, and installed shallow. Um, so we've got them about 18 inches deep and about 15 feet apart. Um, water is forced to pond in these vertical flow wetlands and then filter through the soil to the tile and then out of the drainage system. 
The horizontal flow systems uh, basically are um, 18 inches of rock uh, with a soil cap on the top and then um, vegetation planted on that. Water is forced to flow horizontally through that system. Uh, and then biofilms on the rocks uh, are what we uh, designed this as for to be the mechanism for nutrient removal. Our methods here, uh, our outlet structures of our wetlands um, all have a small V-notch weir in them. Um, and the ones, some of the ones that have weirs have an extra weir in it uh, that actually raises the outlet elevation. So um, within our two ditches that we have each pair, uh, we will have one that has um, essentially no restriction or constriction on the outflow. And then another one that has uh, about a 12 inch constriction. So we're trying to hold uh, about a foot of water back um, and increase the residence time in each one of those systems by changing the outlet elevation uh, of those uh, constructed wetlands. Again, their combined surface and subsurface drain flow. Um, we're monitoring flow and then water quality parameters. And in this particular site, uh, we're gonna be focused today on the nitrate and the dissolved reactive P in terms of the nutrients um, that we'll highlight uh, to focus on. Um, in order to get a, a good idea of some of what the, 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 um, the data uh, look like and why they look the way they do, first need to take a look at the monthly precipitation and the annual precipitation. Um, so between 2017 and 19, 2019, uh, when we're presenting this data for, um, you can see that uh, our long-term mean is 695 millimeters of annual precip, that's about 27 inches. Um, 2017, we had 763, which is about 30 inches. Uh, 2018, we had 977 millimeters, which is about 38 inches. And in 2019, we had uh, just over 1,000 millimeters, which is about 40 inches. Um, so in all three years, we were above the long-term mean. And not only were we above the long-term mean annually, but you can see that uh, from month to month, there was quite a bit of variability among the years. Um, we really like to focus on the entire year from the standpoint that some of the things that happen in these times before the growing season, February, March, uh, April, um, can really have an impact uh, later on in the, in the growing season. So one of the first things we notice is that in 17 and 18, we were at or below average uh, for those early parts of the year. 2019, we were well above average in terms of precipitation um, during the first uh, three or four months of the year. During 2017, uh, we actually uh, had um, a couple of months. Uh, we had June and September that were below average. Um, otherwise, uh, May and August were above average. Uh, when we look at 2018, just about every month was above average. Um, and then 2019, uh, we had June and August again, uh, tended to be uh, a bit on the drier side. When we start to look at some of this data, um, this is a, a table of the summary for each one of the different styles of wetlands. So you can see on the left side, we have the surface flow system, the vertical flow system, and the horizontal flow system. Um, and what we're looking at here is, is the percent difference in annual discharge and then nitrate, nitrogen and dissolved reactive phosphorus. So we have this within the years, and then we have a three-year mean for each one of the sites. Um, one of the first things that you'll notice across this, um, this figure is, is that there's a lot of variability in the discharge uh, from uh, the different styles of wetlands from year to year. Some of it is related to, um, you know, the water holding storage capacity of the surface flow wetlands compared to some of the others. Um, and some of it's uh, related to the fact that um, we cleaned out our, 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 our distribution channel uh, in 2019 and, and um, that sort of changed some of our flow distribution as well. Um, you can see for nitrate, we also have a, a fairly wide range in percents. Uh, most consistent was the vertical flow system. Uh, we were kind of up and down in the horizontal flow system and then also um, 2019, we, uh, we had a, a basically 
the treatment with the the weir in it was actually uh, actually acting as a slight source of nitrate uh, compared to the other two years where where it had almost 100 percent removal of that nitrogen from that system for phosphorus you see the same type of thing you know we go from a low of 7.4 percent in 2017 uh, up to 81 percent in 2018 for the surface flow um, but again on average um, when we start looking at these three-year means, we're you know between 50 and 60 percent reductions, um, which is which is pretty decent, uh, well within expected ranges um, for the surface flow. For the vertical flow, um, the percentages uh, uh, at the low end are a little lower, a uh, low of about 43 percent up to 60 percent, um, and then for the horizontal flow, uh, we're anywhere from 44 to 54 uh, percent reductions. When we start looking at the, the actual um, uh, detailed data, uh, I'm not going to go through every piece of this, um, but we'll see that, uh, again, there's a very large swing in the, the discharge uh, from 550 cubic meters of 550,000 cubic meters of water um, from the control in 2018. Uh, to a low of 551 in 2017 from the treatment. Um, so you're looking at uh, 2017, um, about 130,000 gallons flowed from the treatment channel, uh, upwards of about you know 13 million gallons roughly um, for the the control uh, in the the highest flowing year. Uh, the, the nitrate uh, loads, when we start looking at this, um, again, they, they actually um, were, were extremely low. We were down, you know, roughly around a pound uh, or so uh, in 2017, up to about 15,000 pounds uh, for the horizontal flow system uh, in 2018. Uh, again, a, a pretty big range. Generally speaking, uh, when we're looking at these, um, we are seeing a reduction in the treatment system compared to the control, all except for uh, this 2019 uh, set of values here. The flow weighted concentrations, um, uh, not surprisingly, um, uh, to me, anyway, uh, we, we don't see quite as much difference here um, the, with these wetland systems. It's, it's really based more on uh, a lot of the flow. The, the numbers are, are fairly small. The, the biggest difference was in 2018 between the treatment and the control, um, where we had about three milligrams per liter uh, difference here. For dissolved reactive phosphorus, in terms of this, we, these are in grams. So we're looking at you know, 0.1 pounds um, up to about um, uh, 1.2 pounds uh, when we're at, uh, uh, say, 550 uh, grams. So when we're up here um, at around uh, 38,000, um, you know, we're, we're up at a, a fairly high m m um, mass of, of, uh, of phosphorus that left that system. In uh, the flow weighted concentrations, these are in micrograms per liter. Um, so these are, um, we'd like these to all be, you know, uh, at or below 100 and in fact actually below 30 micrograms per liter, which is kind of a threshold for phosphorus uh, to create eutrophication. Um, you can see that, uh, you know, the most stable types of values uh, we found in that horizontal flow system, um, again, the treatment uh, generally uh, has uh, reduced values except for 2017. Um, uh, the treatment actually ended up having more phosphorus come out uh, and that was um, uh, in, in 18 and 19 from, from the vertical flow system. Um, then uh, for the, uh, the surface flow system, we see uh, that uh, there's a lower concentration coming out there. These might be a little bit difficult to see. We have them on the same scale here. So this is um, 900, uh, the, this is a nitrate load in kilograms. So the, the max number here is 900. So you can see the vertical flow system, um, you know, we're, we're at a much higher loading from that system, generally speaking, than from the surface uh, flow system. Um, 
Uh, you'll be able to see and read about more details of the analysis uh, in the proceedings uh, from, um, from this research, um, just because I won't be able to go through all of the, the details. Uh, but the main thing was is that um, you can see that there's quite a bit of difference in the magnitudes of nitrate loss um, from month to month, as well as uh, from the different styles of wetlands here, um, uh, comparing at least the vertical and the surface flow systems. When we look at dissolved P, um, here we're seeing the, you know, um, uh, relatively uh, stable uh, amounts of P. Uh, we do see some differences from month to month from, the, from both of the systems. Um, more variability here from the surface flow system uh, and compared to the vertical flow system and more consistent losses from the vertical flow system where in, in uh, 18 and 19, which is the bars that you can actually really see well here on this figure, um, that there's more flow uh, coming consistently through there, which is carrying phosphorus, phosphorus, whereas in some of the um, systems here for surface flow, we're not getting much outflow, so we're not really losing much, much P out of those systems. So, so to summarize, um, the water level control structures at the outlets um, help to increase the hydraulic residence time. And so when we start looking at the, the surface flow system, um, it was generally uh, larger from the north to the south. Um, this is the control versus the treatment here. Uh, so control being north, treatment being south. Um, in this particular system, the vertical flow system, um, the water flow was uh, also uh, greater from the control versus the treatment, the north versus the south. And in the horizontal treatment, they're flip-flopped. So the treatment is the south, the control is the, or the, the control is the south, the treatment is the vertical or the north, and uh, we see an opposite effect there. Nitrate load was decreased. Um, when we had more water storage, the residence times were longer. Uh, ortho P was also decreased when we had that longer residence time. Um, we haven't done a complete uh, detailed analysis comparing all the wetland styles yet, but that is to come and you'll see that uh, in the um, proceedings. Thank you. Hi everybody, this is Dr. Lindsay Pease and I am the Nutrient and Water Management Specialist at the Northwest Research and Outreach Center in Crookston. Um, and I am here today to talk a little bit about the potential that we see for phosphorus loss from cover crops in cold climates like we have here in Minnesota. So the key messages um, that I've seen out of um, this recent research that I've done and some of the data I've recently looked at is there are two times of year when phosphorus release by cover crops residue is a potential concern uh, from an environmental perspective. Um, but if you're using phosphorus fertility management as part of your cover crop management strategy, you can minimize your risk of phosphorus loss and uh, really minimize those concerns. So we talk a lot about the benefits of cover crops, and I'm not denying any of that. We know that cover crops prevent soil erosion, um, they can do have some subsoiling benefits, they scavenge nutrients, fix nitrogen, um, and provide pollinator habitat. Um, and there's just a few examples on the right hand side of the screen that just kind of show uh, what the different cover crops can look like, and on the left, um, some of the benefits that these cover crops provide. But there are always trade-offs, and some of these trade-offs we talk about more than others. Um, cover crops really need a um, management strategy. They aren't something you can just uh, seed and, and hope all goes well. You really need a strategy to be able to manage them properly. You know, you need to decide what variety you want, um, seeding rates, timing. Are you going to interseed or plant as soon as you uh, harvest a crop in the fall? Um, application method. Um, again, if you're going to fly that on, or are you going to apply it with a, with a planter? Um, terminating is another question. Um, and fertility management. How are you going to to incorporate your fertility plan when you are uh, have these other factors, these other management factors that you also need to keep in mind. And so 
today I'm just going to touch briefly on the fertility management side and maybe some of the trade-offs and things you need to keep in mind as you're developing your phosphorus management strategy to go along with cover crops. Cover crops. We know cover crops are good at scavenging nutrients. Um, they are great at scavenging nitrogen, and they can also be really good at, at scavenging excess phosphorus that's left at the end of the growing season. But there's a big question um, as to when they release that phosphorus, and is it going to be released at a time when it's going to be available to be taken up by the next season's crop? Um, and so, I recently had an opportunity to look at some data that actually was collected by Dr. Al Sims, uh, the current research director at the Northwest Research and Outreach Center and the former uh, director of operations here at the Southwest Research and Outreach Center. Uh, but one of the last experiments that he had done uh, was actually looking at how much phosphorus um, could be taken up and then released uh, by three different cover crop species. Um, on the bottom of the screen, from left to right, there's buckwheat, cereal rye, and forage radish. And um, basically, these crops were, were grown in a plot um, with three rates of phosphorus applied, and um, the green tissue was sampled. And uh, then they were taken and frozen inside, um, then submerged in water. And uh, then the amount of phosphorus that was released from the residue was then measured for total phosphorus and dissolved phosphorus. And so on the next slide, I'm just going to really quickly talk about some of those results. So just to orient you up to this graph. We see on the left hand side uh, is SRP is our dissolved phosphorus, our soluble reactive phosphorus. Um, and then on the below that is total phosphorus. Along the top we have our three different phosphorus fertilizer application rates. So from zero pounds per acre all the way up to 150. And on the bottom, we see the, the hours, the number of hours that the residue was submerged. So um, that residue was submerged for up to four days. Uh, so we have 24 hours all the way up to 96 hours uh, that you see along the bottom. So kind of multiple things happening on this graph. Um, the different uh, lines that you see are the cover crop species. Um, the cereal rye is on the top and forage radish in the middle, and buckwheat is always on the bottom. So one of the things you can see really right away from this graph is that all of the residue released fairly similar amounts of phosphorus. These were significantly different from a statistical sense, but, um, but they all follow about the same trend. And, and that is they released the most amount of phosphorus at the beginning, and that amount of phosphorus released by the residue um, declined over time. The other thing to take a look at here is how uh, the different phosphorus rates uh, interacted with how the different species released that phosphorus. So we see that even when there was no phosphorus fertilizer applied, those cover crops were able to take up phosphorus that was in the soil um, and, and take it up into its uh, plant tissues. So they were able to extract that phosphorus even when there wasn't any applied. Now there was more release when fertilizer was applied and at greater rates. Um, but again, you can see that, that really the overall trend stays the same regardless of the amount of phosphorus that you apply. Now, when we start interpreting these numbers, these numbers don't really mean anything just on their own, but I put these dashed lines of the graph to help us give some um, context for, for what these concentrations mean uh, from an environmental sense. At the top, uh, for our SRP, you can see that number is almost zero, and that's because it is 0 0.05 parts per million. That is the amount of phosphorus that can be potentially harmful to aquatic life. Um, this concentration of phosphorus, when it makes it into surface water, is 
what we see associated with harmful algal blooms. So that's why that is a concentration that we just sort of want to keep in mind. On the total phosphorus graph, we have another line that's almost zero. This is a different line. This is the concentration of total phosphorus that's recommended by the International Red River Board um, to have for the Red River to have at the US Canada border. Um, so Northwest Minnesota, we our water flows north. Uh, via the Red River all the way up north into Winnipeg in Canada and ultimately into Lake Winnipeg and they are seeing algal blooms in Lake Winnipeg so you know the concentration at the top of the graph that potentially harmful concentration does come into play when we talk about Lake Winnipeg and the recommended concentration by the International Red River Board is really to um, establish kind of what's a fair amount for the U.S. to be contributing to any uh, phosphorus and nutrients that we see in the Canadian lake. And um, one thing that I will say is that these numbers do seem really high in comparison to the concentrations. And there is a lot of things that can happen to this residue from the time it's released um, and then it makes it into the soil and then or potentially gets carried into the water. And that's what I'm going to talk a little bit about next. Um, but I did want to give you guys some context for these numbers and why this phosphorus release issue might be something that we want to keep an eye on. So this, this slide um, just talks about one of the times of the year when we might be concerned that phosphorus is released into the environment. And this is in October when we have seen our very first frost uh, of the year. And uh, in 2019, this happened sort of between October 18th and October 30th, uh, we had planted some cover crops at the Northwest Research and Outreach Center for a different experiment um, right at the end of wheat harvest. And we had uh, the extremely wet fall that was prevalent all across Minnesota um, last fall. So, so it was really wet, but we did get the cover crops in and they were just starting to grow uh, when we got that cold weather and the frost and um, you can see on the right that that cover crop residue really just got sapped uh, by the cold weather and this is a good slide to show as an example of this because this is one of those times when uh, the cover crop residue could freeze and we could have those really high levels of phosphorus release that I showed on the previous slide we could have those high numbers released right here um, at this time on this soil. And so if we know that's going to happen, um, we want to be able to manage for it. So the way that you minimize fall phosphorus loss is to prevent phosphorus buildup in the soil profile in the first place. And this experiment really showed um, a couple of things about phosphorus application and one of the first things they tested was does corn yield increase as you increase your phosphorus levels and, and the answer is no um, and I think this is kind of what uh, we've been saying for a long time is that your phosphorus losses you know they kind of they start making a curve but they sort of balance out um, once you get above a certain level. And that really does seem to be kind of that medium soil fertility test category. Once you get much above, you know, 11 parts per million Olsen or 15 parts per million Bray, you really start to see yields um, drop off and you're not getting the return on the extra phosphorus you're applying. So, but one of the other things that can happen when your soils are high or very high, um, in addition to not helping 
your crops yield better, um, then there actually is nowhere for that phosphorus that's released by that cover crop residue. It doesn't have anywhere to bind in the soil. And so in that way, um, there is an increased potential for that to be kind of swept up in, in water and in soil moisture and to run off the field, either as surface runoff or potentially as tile drainage if you have that under your field. So uh, this graph is from AgVice Labs and they had a slide on their website um, that showed kind of the percentage of samples that came back below that Olson 10 parts per million level. That's kind of that medium soil test category. And this really depends on where you are in the state, um, if you're where your soil tests are coming back. And, and as you can see, it's sort of in the most northern part of the Red River Valley, it's at 71% are below that 10 parts per million rate. But as you go further and further south, you can see that more and more soils are testing kind of above that medium soil fertility category. And so this is where we start getting into that kind of risky levels with respect to water quality. So, you know, if you're sort of below that level, I would say probably not worry about it. Um, you're phosphorus that's released in that fall event is, is probably going to be absorbed by the soil. Um, but if you're kind of close to that high, especially if you're very high, I would really start thinking about how you might start drawing down that phosphorus, reducing those phosphorus applications, because you don't want to end up in a situation where that residue um, releases phosphorus and it doesn't have anywhere to bind. Um, then you're not using it for your crops. Um, it's not being stored, it's it's going to be leaving the field. So that's what's going to happen with your soils in the fall. Um, in the spring, we have a slightly different soil scenario happening. And uh, to help illustrate this, I made a couple of images um, just in Microsoft PowerPoint to kind of help illustrate what I'm trying to show here. Um, in an unfrozen soil profile, you have, you know, the blue is the sky, uh, white is the snow on top of the brown, which is our soil profile. So and as that snow melts, if it's not frozen, it will, it will seep down into the soil profile. So let's say you've got some cover crop residue buried under the snow. If nothing's frozen, that water will carry it down into the soil profile and hopefully it will get tied up uh, by uh, the soil particles um, in deeper layers and then be potentially available for your crop the following spring. But what we see when you have frozen soils is that the top layer and the bottom layer, those are in brown, um, those remain, those, those may thaw uh, first, but then you might get a frozen layer in the middle that's sort of sandwiched between uh, two unfrozen layers. And so this slide kind of shows a little bit what might happen to the water during snow melt uh, when you have that frozen soil layer. And what you see is that the water kind of seeps down and it starts melting that soil layer, but actually it doesn't have anywhere to go. So it backs up and actually leads to some surface runoff. So that's what this blue is representing here is that during this melting process, the soil can sort of overwhelm that capacity uh, and, and not have anywhere to go, which is going to generate surface runoff. And this is a concern uh, because in the spring, uh, especially in the Northwest, but this happens throughout Southern Minnesota, when you get that snow melt, it can really result in a lot of water moving up and out of the land. So again, if we think about that cover crop residue that is sitting on top of the soil here, um, that is going to go down about so far, but if it can't go down any further, then there's an increased likelihood it could get into the surface runoff and ultimately carried um, off into the environment. So how do we minimize the spring phosphorus loss? I think really the way to do that, um, the best way I could think of was to think of minimizing 
minimizing the runoff in the first place. And um, there's a couple ways you can do that and actually cover crops are a potential answer uh, to this problem, right? If you have uh, the certain cover crop species, um, this is a radish on the left and then that's buckwheat again on the in the middle, um, they can develop some root systems and if you can increase your bulk density in those upper soil layers, those unfrozen layers, um, that could potentially increase your capacity to hold water and store it in the landscape while those kind of middle layers, that middle sandwiched ice layer is uh, melting and thawing. So uh, that's one strategy, you know, kind of increase the, the bulk density, reduce the compaction of those upper layers. Um, so you have more space for the water to infiltrate. And the other way um, to think about minimizing runoff is actually with those, with using buffers or riparian buffers. I know buffers are kind of not overly popular uh, in many parts of the state, but this is one of the scenarios where the buffers can help. Now that said, you do have to make sure that they don't have the same problem um, that we're talking about with um, becoming oversaturated with phosphorus. They do only have a finite capacity to store phosphorus. And once you reach that capacity, if the residue isn't being harvested, if that phosphorus is just kind of stuck there, if it's trapped there, um, then those phosphorus levels will build up over time and you'll sort of reduce the filtering capacity of those buffers. So just another kind of management aspect of buffers. They can be useful, but they again, like cover crops, are, are a living system and therefore need a management plan to really get the most out of their benefits. And so just to kind of wrap up here, um, we do see a potential for phosphorus loss from cover crop residue. That freezing of the cover crop residue releases a lot of phosphorus and it does have the potential to be environmentally significant. And the phosphorus released by uh, cover crop residue is, is a potential concern kind of two times of the year after the first killing frost, which we in Northwest Minnesota often see in October and during snowmelt, which we see kind of in that March to April timeframe. But your two strategies to kind of combat that is preventing phosphorus buildup in the soil in the first place and um, second to prevent surface runoff in order to minimize the risk of phosphorus release to the environment. And um, and really, I think what I would just encourage everyone to do is really think about that phosphorus management and nitrogen management too, for that matter. There's a lot of planning that needs to go involved into cover crops. It's already something that you're not just going to kind of throw out there and see what happens. Um, so I would really encourage you to just really think about those nutrient processes um, so you can plan for this and, and sort of not be caught off guard if you aren't seeing um, some of those returns from nutrient scavenging that you might be expecting. So thank you very much for listening and um, I hope I get a chance to answer some questions uh, from you all uh, shortly. Thank you. Hi Lindsay, make sure you get yourself unmuted. All um, right, I think I, can everybody I, hear I can hear you. Great. I can hear you. Excellent. Um, it doesn't look like you and I have any questions. <laughs> um, I know that, uh, you know, we're up over the lunch hour. I know there were still uh, quite a few people that were on. Um, but maybe uh, since you and I were, uh, uh, you know, you were slidoing in and I was asking questions a lot of people, maybe we don't have too many people that are left to ask questions. <laughs> possible <laughs> you know I, I actually have a question since I have you uh, and we're thinking about phosphorus um, you know when I when I was looking at um, at, at your re your results and you were talking about uh, some of those flushes like in October um, mm -hmm. you know when we've seen in our 
you know, drainage ditch systems, uh, you know, in that one set of data that I showed earlier. Um, th that's exactly what we saw. Uh, the thing is, is that it was, it was just kind of a weird year because we've had other types of events, but, um, you know, they didn't produce the phosphorus. So, I mean, I know that I don't want to put you on the spot too much here, but, you know, you are a much better phosphorus expert than me. Um, so do you think that um, that we've got a combination of a lot of different things going on likely, but do you think that, um, you know, we can have some potential for maybe some of this, you know, water to be stored, you know, in fields that maybe have been tilled. So there's some storage capacity in the field. So some years we may see this, some years we don't, um, you know, in our situations with the ditches or the wetlands, we can see fluxes, but that's partly probably because we have a lot of vegetation already in those areas. So um, what's your perspective on how we might mitigate other places where there's perennial grasses? or yeah. vegetation like we have because the cover crops are seasonal what we've got up here or down here in some of our systems is not and we know that we're still going to get phosphorus leaking from time to time right and 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 jeff i think you're i think you're right in that you know it's just a really complicated phosphorus is just a lot more complicated than uh it looks on its face right like it's it's not just that it gets bound up in the soil and stays there um you know and and i think um, when you're talking about kind of all vegetation, um, what, what others have seen and what I've seen in the literature too is, is that harvesting that residue is a good way to, like if we're talking about buffers or, or riparian, riparian areas, like kind of harvesting that and, and getting it off the land and putting it somewhere else is kind of one way to mitigate it. Um, but that's a lot of work too. So yeah, so I think it's, um, you know, but I, but I also think that, you know, I mean, the soil is really dynamic also. And so your kind of point about if there's tillage, um, is that going to, you know, change the soil's ability to kind of store that water? I mean, I think absolutely. I mean, bulk density, especially in the top six inches, um, can be really variable, you know, depending on what crop you're growing, what your tillage practices are. Did you have to drive your tractor through the field when you were at, right. <laughs> you know, saturation, um, which, you know, which we definitely, definitely saw um, a lot of last fall. So, yeah, so it's so many things. <laughs> it's, it's, it, P is so much, I mean, N is complicated. P is much more complicated just because of the dynamics, I think. Mm -hmm. um, there is a question for you on, on Slido there that says, how big did those cover crops get? Um, are you aware of how big those got in that study? Yeah, you know, um, that is a good question. And, and I don't know off the top of my head, but I think they let them what um, Albert had shared with me is they let them grow for a few weeks. Um, so probably, probably pretty small. Um, you know, they, they kind of let the cover crops grow a little bit. Um, and then they harvested that green plant tissue and froze it right away. So, sure. um, and, and those were concentrations that I was presenting. So um, I didn't go so far as to try to estimate, you know, <laughs> like what, what load we might have seen off of that, right. but you know, that would be, I mean, actually probably if you combined this data with some of Axel's that he presented earlier, maybe you could get at an estimate. <laughs> well, I, you know, Lindsay, I was just going to do that. Is that. I don't know if Axel's still on. I haven't been futzing with my computer to see who the participants, it's up, participants are yet. But if Axel, if you're still on, flick your uh, microphone on and join in this because I had a quick question for you if you're still here. Go ahead. Ah, great. Thanks for being still on, Axel. So this kind of relates to what Lindsay was just mentioning about the two data sets that you guys have. And I'm wondering, have you done any phosphorus measurements in some of those plots that you've been working with, Axel? Yes, I have actually, uh, <clears throat> but I have not analyzed those, those data. I've been okay. trying to focus uh, much more in nitrogen things. So, so Axel, have you done any looking at any of the, have you collected plant tissues that you've saved that you'd be able to look at what the pea content of that is so that you, you know, like in some of our watersheds, you're part of the watersheds that we're working in where we could potentially get some of that cover crop material running off into our, you know, our waterways and then down into the wetlands and the ditches. And so 
you know, dead residue plus some of the cover crop residue that could contribute, I suppose. No, I don't actually, okay. but I, I already got some information. Probably uh, we can later discuss this, Lindsay. What you are doing is really yeah. interesting. Yeah, I might have tons of questions, but I am not, awesome. uh, no, I, I am not very into this. So I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wait to learn more than I will ask. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I, thanks for jumping on there and joining the conversation, Axel. Um, you know, I, I, I know it's, it's getting pretty late and I, I, uh, I, I'm, 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 I'm happy how this went. Uh, I, I, I'm looking out my window and seeing it be partly sunny and it would have been great to have a field tour, but of course, uh, under the conditions and situations for safety, we've opted not to do that. Um, I've got a few real quick uh, housekeeping things uh, before we conclude. First, I want to first and foremost, definitely want to be acknowledging and giving uh, a big thanks and shout out to Emily Nepperman um, Evans, who uh, is. Um, been behind the scenes helping with this and helping get things set up and and um, so Emily thanks for all of that and um, you know whoever's still on uh, the people that are still on Emily will be sending uh, um, uh, emails with the evaluations if you already haven't filled one out uh, and then she'll be also um, letting people know when the uh, proceedings is available online and when it's available uh, on um, uh, when the when the presentations are available online, um, uh, I see Emily's also posted out, out there uh, in the chat that uh, she has a link set up to uh, the uh, the evaluation. So um, go ahead and please fill that out. Uh, it, it helps us um, as we move forward. I also want to thank all of you participants for hanging in there with us and the presenters. Um, I know this is way different than what we ordinarily do, and I appreciate you guys. Uh, submitting presentations and working on these proceedings. Um, it's made for what I would uh, say is a successful day. Again, please remember to fill out those evaluations um, and stay tuned to our, our website. There'll be a link on there um, uh, to these different components, the, the proceedings and the presentations. And then finally, just wanna mention, um, you know, uh, with, with hopefully everything will be, uh, you know, different in 2023 and we will be doing our eighth um, soil water management field day. Hopefully we'll be able to do that one live. So um, again, I wanna thank everyone and um, uh, have, a, have a great day. <laughs>